the satellite coordinates for today's press conference. SES-3 forward slash 14K slot B9. A friendly, friendly reminder, cell phones should be turned off or put on silent and that flash photography is not permitted. Hammond Communications is providing the video feed which will be available on the FTP site found on the NCAA Media Hub. Therefore, no video cameras are permitted, including cell phones or tablets. Thank you for, for your cooperation. Also, the locker rooms to interview players not on stage will be open for 30 minutes during this press conference period.
two water there. Yeah, I have two cups. Yeah, you have them? Yeah, I got two. Can we get two cups? Yeah. Uh, can we get one more cup? Yeah. All right, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Thank you. Okay, we are here with Creighton student athletes Stephen Ashworth, Francisco Farabello, and Ryan Cockbrenner. We have up to 20 minutes with the student athletes before head coach Greg McDermott. Please raise your hand to ask a question, and someone with a microphone will come over. Please state your name and media affiliation. If you're joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We will address the questions in the room first and get to the Zoom if time allows. Questions for student athletes. Front right. Matt DeMarinas, White and Blue Review. Just curious what you guys, what your impressions were of watching Oregon yesterday and studying them a little bit on film and kind of going through some of their tendencies. Ryan, you want to start and work your way down? Uh, yeah, they're obviously a really, really good basketball team. Uh, looking specifically at my matchup against uh, their big man. I mean, he's a really, really good player, really big, really physical, a good touch around the rim. So. Uh, we, we definitely got to be locked in, prepared for this team, but uh, I think if we do what Mac asked us to do and do the game plan we put out there, I think we got a good chance. Francisco? Um, yeah, super talented basketball team. I mean, there is a reason why they're here. I'm the one Pac-12, uh, the Pac-12 uh, tournament. Um, one of their players dropped 40 the other day, so that's, that's not a minor factor. Um, but yeah, as, as Cox said, like we're going to have a plan. I feel like we're going to be ready for them. Steven? Uh, I think I noticed that they play with uh, a, lot of, a lot of good pace, a lot of athleticism on the court. And they have a few different defenses that they like to throw at teams. And so uh, got to continue to study the film, see where uh, our matchups bode well against them and, and those type of things on defensive end and offensive end. And uh, just enjoying the journey and looking forward to another chance to play uh, another basketball game. Questions for student athletes? Middle aisle. James Kreppi from the Oregonian. Steven, you faced these guys back when you were at Utah State a couple of years ago in the uh, NIT. Schematically, what they do defensively particularly really doesn't change much, even though the names and numbers might. What do you remember of some of that and, and what from what you've seen on tape so far applies about their defense? What makes it kind of difficult from a matchup zone standpoint? Yeah, they've got a lot of athleticism and a lot of length. Uh, when you have perimeter guys that can get uh, a lot of deflections and run out into transition. It, it fuels their offense. And I remember playing them the NIT at Utah State. That was uh, really what hurt us in the second half of that game. Uh, I, I believe we had the lead at the first half. But at the second half, uh, they really came out and were aggressive and extended that zone. And, uh, and so spacing is a key against all of that, making sure that you keep your spacing and keep your movement. Uh, because when teams get stagnant uh, and pushed up the floor, they're really, really hard to score against. And so. Those are some of the things that I remember. And I mean, yeah, there's different teams. And, and we're a completely different team than, than uh, I played with at Utah State. And so uh, excited about it. But those are some of the things that I think are similar to, to years past. Tom, back left. Uh, Tom Weathers, Associated Press. Ryan, I'm just curious, because you're your defensive prowess, I'm sure teams try to pull you out away from the rim a lot, like Akron did yesterday. Is that, is that pretty common? And how do you guys usually counter that? Uh, yeah, I mean, if the other team has a big man that can shoot, they definitely uh, use that to their advantage to pull me out and stretch our defense out a lot. Um, I mean, as far as how we counter that, it's pretty pretty matchup based for what the other team has as far as like other players on the court. We've done a few different things throughout the year, trying to figure out what works best for us when we play against teams like that. but. Um, I think as we've gotten later in the year, we've made certain adjustments and come up with certain game plans that work a little better for us than we had at the beginning of the year. So I, I like uh, where we're at against teams that play with uh, big men that can shoot. So uh, yeah, it definitely changes what we like to do, but uh, I think we've made some good adjustments throughout the year. Uh, since I got the mic, I, I know Coach Altman's time at Creighton predates most of your lives, but I was just curious if you're aware of his legacy there, and is, uh, does Coach Mack talk at all about what, what Dana did and how he helped build Creighton into what it is now? Uh, yeah, Mack does bring him up every now and then. I mean, uh, Coach Altman definitely kind of laid the foundation for now where the program's at today, and Mac, when Mack took over, just 
built upon what Coach Altman had already done there. Obviously, he was really, really successful at Creighton. So, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of respect for him as a coach and what he's doing over there at Oregon now, too. Left middle. Will Graves, AP. Guys, I was talking to Sterling the other day about being the hype guy or whatever, the handshake dude at the end of the line. I'm sort of curious, um, and I've talked to players at other teams that have that same sort of responsibility. I mean, what kind of energy does that bring? And do you guys sort of, he talked about the dances he tries to get y'all to do or whatever. I mean, what kind of energy does that bring to the group? Steven, you want to start that? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think it brings followers uh, is the first thing all the dances Sterling tries to get us to do. Uh, he's just a joy to be around as a kid that is always having a smile on his face and is uh, trying to uplift others. And he's got talents on and off the court, and he tries to, to show those. And I think that it gives us all a, a good boost of energy when he's doing that. I'm not from here, and that's, that's not something that we do overseas. <laughs> but I respect it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, what Steven said, I, the season gets really long, and it's good to have guys like that that, you know, just the simple fact by just dancing, they just can lift your energy up. So it's a joy to be around them. Ryan? Uh, yeah, like these guys, I mean, uh, it's always nice to have guys on the team who are just having – fun and bring good energy even if like you know Sterling's red shirting and so he's not playing but he's still bringing really good energy to the team and so guys like that are awesome him Sammy Brock Shane Josh all those guys have done a great job all year bringing good energy questions for student athletes right here to the right thanks guys uh Adam Zalanka field level media for the guards, um, San Francisco mentioned Oregon, who has a player who had 40 points yesterday. Um, just to follow up on that, when you're game planning, preparing for a team with a guy who can, who just did that, does that um, do you do you focus more on him, or do you do you are you concerned that like if you focus too much on one player, then you, other people might be left open and have a hot night of their own? See if you want to take that. Yeah, I think that's a, a very fair question. I think that especially at this stage, there's only 32 teams left. And so every team out here has really talented players. And if you start to focus too heavily on just one person, I do think that others can, can tend to hurt you in ways that you weren't quite prepared for. So I think we're really trying to do a good job of holistically looking at their group and understanding at the same time that he's in a really good rhythm and finding ways that we can maybe counteract that as well as just continuing to see how our defense and how our style uh, might give them uh, problems as well before we try to uh, adjust too much to what they do really, really well. Ray Middle. Uh, Justin Guerrero, Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Ryan, you mentioned uh, Oregon's big man, Dante. He got to the free throw line 15 times yesterday. I'm, I'm wondering just for you, when you have a, a matchup like that, there's going to be a lot of contact. He's going to be living in the paint. Just what are the challenges for you going up against a guy like that? And, and in particular, just trying to defend him cleanly and staying out of foul trouble? Uh, yeah, I mean, we know, I mean, obviously watching the game yesterday, shot a lot of free throws. He's gonna, they're probably going to try to do that again, get me in foul trouble and whatnot. But uh, I feel like, uh, especially in the Big East, we played a lot of bigs who were super physical like that. A lot of bigs who are trying to, not necessarily trying to draw fouls, but there's going to be a lot of confrontations at the rim. So I've gotten a lot of practice this year at trying to stay out of foul trouble. I think I've done a pretty good job so far. So I'll just try to do that again. But I mean, like I said, he's a really talented big man who's super physical. So I'll have my hands full for sure. But um, we'll try my best. Left middle. Ryan, sort of to follow up on that, I don't know if you saw the end of the Kansas game last night, but there was a call at the rim at the end. Do you think there should be a capacity for fouls to be reviewed at any point? Um, seems like above my pay grade to be thinking about stuff at ref rules. Uh, I just try to play the game the way the rules have it as it is now. And, you know, if I ever become a coach one day, then I'll start uh, thinking about those types of things. That's a coach type answer, so I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> All right, questions for student athletes. Front right. You, you guys collectively have played in, I mean, Ryan, you've played in the most NCAA tournament games in Creighton history. You guys have all played in a bunch now. Um, how do you 
like when you go into a situation like this, it might feel normal to you, but it's not to maybe everybody else watching. How does your experience kind of play itself out, manifest itself in an NCAA tournament game? See if you want to start and work your way down. Sure. Uh, yeah, this is my uh, third opportunity to play in March Madness, and so uh, I think that there is a lot of uh, advantage to somebody who's been in situations like this before, played a lot of postseason games, and understand what's at stake, but also at the same time that you can't get too caught up in, in the moment. You have to be present and do what's now. And then also it's just, uh, from my perspective, it's a joy playing with guys like this that have that experience as well, that we can all lean on each other and trust each other in big time moments. And and uh, it seems like time and time again, people are ready to deliver. And so that's a testament to, to the team we have as a whole, just being ready to go. And uh, it's something that I think we're, we're using well to our advantage this year. Francisco? Uh, yeah, like you said, it's not normal. Like not, not a lot of players get the opportunity to play uh, what we're playing right now. Uh, and of course there's excitement. Uh, but I mean, I remember Coach Mack yesterday before the game, like pe players tend to, to to let the excitement take on their game, you know, spit them up. Uh, but we try, we try to be as calm as we can, you know. Uh, and the most important part at the end of the day is just having fun and enjoying it. And I think we, we've been doing a pretty good job with that so far. Ryan? Uh, yeah, I think once you uh, play in this tournament a time or two, you start to find a balance of like having urgency and playing f and playing free. Like Bella said, some it's easy to get sped up in these moments and think you got to go too much, go and try to do too much, especially like when you have three, four plays in a row that don't go your way. Uh, but once you get some experience, you can kind of slow down and find that balance of you know, okay, it's time to maybe be a little more locked in because we've had a few things not go our way, but not do it too much to where you start messing up because you're trying to do too much. So uh, I think that experience definitely helps a lot in finding that balance. Tom? I'm with his AP. Francisco, since you're not from Nebraska, how did how did Creighton find you or how did you find Creighton? Um, very different than what I was used to. Uh, I played three years at TCU and, and four was a lot different than Omaha. Uh, the DFW area just in general. But um, I've been asked that question this last two months since uh, it's my senior year, and and uh, and that's it. Um, I loved it. I loved it since I stepped the the first the first day since I stepped foot on campus. I loved it. The Creighton community is incredible, um, and I've been saying this. I never, I probably never be part of something as big as Creighton basketball, um, and, and and I enjoyed and I'm enjoying uh, as much as I can. I had no idea, no. <laughs> now, the first time that I heard it was, I was playing in Australia, and one of my teammates, Sam Froling, he he was getting recruited by Creighton, but still, like, even when I committed to TCU, I had no idea what Creighton, what Creighton was and, and where it was. Uh, but as I said, I loved it every moment. Right middle. Justin Guerrero with the Pittsburgh trip again. This is for uh, any or all of you guys up there, and it's, uh, bear with me. It's not about the the game tomorrow, but uh, I'm wondering if any of you guys uh, caught anything of the uh, Kentucky Oakland game after you guys wrapped up. One of their players, Jack Golke, kind of just came out of nowhere, drained ten three pointers. That was one short of the all time NCAA tournament record for three pointers. And what I'm getting at is just for you guys being here in March Madness. That is this an opportunity? To, do you guys have the ability to just take a step back and just appreciate a performance like that? Or are you guys kind of just so locked in on yourselves that maybe you're you're not all, all that concerned, even when there is like a just a super crazy historic performance like that? All right, you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I did watch some of that game. And uh, you, I think even when you're a player playing in the tournament, you, you can't take a second and go like, wow, that was really crazy <laughs> what they did. Probably not. Probably not taking it in as much as I will in the future when I'm watching it as a fan, but you definitely see it and just get go like, wow, that's kind of crazy. All right, questions for student athletes. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
more light in here too. Okay, once again, please raise your hand to ask a question and someone with the oh, microphone shit. will come over. Need another water? <laughs> that's, a, that's what you call a turnover before the game even starts. No, I'm good. You sure? Also, please state your name and media affiliation. If you're joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We will address questions in the room first and get to Zoom if time allows. Okay, questions for Coach McDermott. Front right. Matt DeMarinas, White and Blue Review. Mac, I know you guys have a, you know, kind of a cheat code of yourself in the middle there, but w in what you've learned about Nafali Dante and shooting 84% over his last seven games and high volume, w w what kind of a challenge do you think that's going to present tomorrow? Yeah, he's terrific, um, and you know you look at their team with him versus without him. Uh, you know this is a team that's you know grossly underseeded. <laughs> if if you know, if Dana had this group of guys uh, available all season long, uh, he wouldn't have needed to play in the Pac-12 tournament to win it to get in the NCAA tournament. He would have had a very good seed, um, and they're playing great basketball right now. He he Dante impacts the game on both ends of the floor. Uh, he's very physical at the rim offensively, and then he's a uh, uh, tremendous rim protector on the other end. And you know his physicality is obviously going to be a problem for us. Questions for Coach? To the right. Greg Adams, Alonka, Field Level Media. Looking at the tape yesterday of Cousinard, what did what jumped out at you in the way he got to his 40 points, and how are you di like balancing dialing in on him versus not leaving some of his teammates over <coughs> the backcourt? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think you ever want to overreact uh, to a you know a crazy outstanding game by a player. I think you know everybody has them. Not many have them like the one he had yesterday on this stage. Um, but he, you know, he he scored at every level yesterday, and you know we have to make sure that the best we can get him to take the shots that we want him to take, not the shots that he wants to take. And that's that sounds easy in theory. It's very difficult because of his size and strength and the pace that he plays with. Um, and when he's making three point shots at a level like that, you know, it's very problematic because of all the other things that he can do. But you know, we'll give him some different looks. We'll put some different guys on him. Uh, probably mix up our ball screen coverages so he doesn't get comfortable, uh, but he's he's a terrific player and you know he's had the game of the tournament so far. Question over here on the left. Brooke Pryor, ESPN. Greg, how has your relationship and friendship with Dana evolved <clears throat> since you took over for him, and is it a little surreal to be going against him in in this situation on this stage? Yeah, I mean it's 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 quite a history. Uh, you know, I took uh, the Wayne State job uh, in Wayne, Nebraska, Division II school in 1994. I think Dana started at Creighton in 92. So you know, I watched him kind of build the program in the early years and then took the Northern Iowa job in 2001, and then I competed against him uh, you know, with Corver and Tolliver and the great teams that he had. Um, you know, and at that time, you're competing and you're recruiting against each other, and you're, you know, you're probably not going to dinner together. Uh, but we've always had respect for each other. And then when I moved to Omaha, um, you know, first of all, he recruited Doug, you know, right before he left. And uh, he's a cheater to start because he, he took me to play golf. Uh, him and Bruce Rasmussen, the athletic director at the time, they gave a couple phony handicaps. Uh, I totally lost the game on the first tee, and I ended up paying them. I mean, usually the dad of a recruit is probably not going to have to pay the head coach uh, after the golf round. But that was the case that particular day. Um, but since my time in Omaha, you know, now a lot of my very close personal friends are also people that were very close personal friends of Dana when he was in town. And you, you learn a lot about someone by talking to their friends and, and how he treated people. Uh, Dana's family is still uh, very close to our program. Uh, his, his father, Lyle, until his health deteriorated a little and his brother Dirk would come to our monthly basketball luncheons with their Creighton gear on and, and support us um, you know through everything and I've said hi to Dirk yesterday actually walking off the floor um, so you know I think we've developed a friendship as a result of that 
and you know we'll get a, I'll get a text from him after a big game. He'll get one from me once in a while, uh, but you know very uh, high level of respect for the job that he did. And you know when you take over a program, I've always felt it's important to embrace your history and and make sure um, that our players understand of the work that the people that came before us did. And, and certainly Dana's era uh, of him as a coach and the guys that played for him, you know, laid the groundwork for, you know, for me to happen and Doug to happen and the Big East to happen. None of that, none of that is, that's a, that's a pipe dream uh, without Dana Altman. So, you know, he, he'll, he'll always be beloved in our community. Uh, I know this will be a hard game uh, for some of our fans tomorrow because they, they cheer for Dana absolutely every game. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, uh, interesting that we ended up in the same bracket. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the good news is one of us is going to go on. And I guess the bad news is one of us is going to have to go home. Left aisle. James, James Crepia from the Oregonian. Greg, these are also instances where we usually get to reflect and look back at years where we don't necessarily do 14 years later. When you were taking over, because you were taking over after some success from him by comparison to what he was taking over at Oregon, can you reflect back at what that 2011 CBI matchup at that time and going back and forth, what that meant? And as you went about instilling a culture there after success, and then at the end of that season, oh, yeah, by the way, now you have to face the former coach and the former players, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It was a freaking nightmare is what it was, to be honest. I mean, it's the last thing you want to do as a new coach who's replacing a guy who's beloved by everybody and, and has had a, you know, unprecedented success is, you know, we're going to go to this tournament that neither of us really want to go to. And you look at the bracket and you're on opposite ends. And, you know, of course, we went all, all of our games and they went all their games. And the next thing you know, we're in a three-game series with Oregon. Uh, I think we were probably responsible for getting a line on the floor at half court. Uh, because we got beat in game three in a tie game. Uh, my point guard is out at half court getting set up the offense, and he, he's somewhere standing on the trees at half court. And the referee has a better than 20-20 vision because so, somehow he picked out that his heel was on that little broken line that went through the forest. Uh, and he called it over and back, and then we got beat uh, on, on a shot at the next end. But, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was, it was an interesting way to end that first year. Um, but you could see at that time already that Dana was instilling uh, in, the, in the Oregon program the way he wanted things done. And, you know, we had inherited a group of seniors. Um, that team for me was really five or six seniors and then five or six young guys, which was Doug's freshman class. Uh, but he had really good dudes that he had recruited to, to that program. And those six guys, five or six guys, those seniors, they, you know, while we didn't win as much as we would like to that year, they really instilled um, what we wanted, the standards and the culture that we were trying to get the program to be moving forward. Right front. Matt Marinas, White and Blue Review. Mac, I, I know this isn't going to affect the prep or certainly not going to be present in your mind when the game gets tipped off, but with Rask here in Pittsburgh watching the two, the only two, head coaches that he hired for men's basketball go at it in the 30 years that he was the athletic director like what what is that going to mean anything to you I mean Bruce Rasmussen means everything to me and uh, and I'm sure Dana would speak about Bruce in a very similar way um, besides being our boss and the guy that gave us an opportunity uh, he was a mentor to me um, and, and became a great friend and is still a great friend today and a mentor today. Um, and, it, you know, I, I, I think you, you become, as you go through this journey of life, I think you, you become a lot of what the people around you are like and what you learn from them. And I, I think you can see a lot of what's happening in Oregon's program and our program and the way that people are treated um, is probably a direct result of Dana's relationship and my relationship with Bruce because of what we learned from him and his ability to um, have absolutely no agenda for himself. Uh, it's always about somebody else. And, it, and, and simply, it's, it's why the culture that he created you know, still exists at Creighton. You know, it's why you have you know, Debbie Conroy, our golf coach, women's golf coach, has been there 31 years. Tom Lilly, women's tennis, 27 years. Dan Chips rowing 24 years, Jim Flannery in women's basketball, I think 22. And then I think coach service in baseball and Kirsten in volleyball have been 20 or 21. And I'm at 14. Like that's half of our staff. 
and you know we've been there forever uh, and it's it's because of the culture uh, that Bruce has created and now Father Hendrickson and, and Marcus Blossom, just like I carried the torch uh, from Dana. Um, you know, they're carrying that torch from Bruce. But it, it, uh, it'll be bittersweet for him tomorrow. Um, he assured me last night, though, that th this is Blue Jays all the way. So uh, I haven't seen him face to face, but he made it clear in a late night text because uh, neither of us sleep after a game. So he just wanted to make sure I knew this was, uh, I'm supposed to kick Oregon's ass, as he said. <laughs> Back left. Uh, Tom Weathers, AP. So what did you shoot that day, and what did Dana shoot? <laughs> well, I I don't know what the scores were, but <laughs> I, I know the cash exchange afterwards was not in my favor. But uh, uh, no, they took me to Omaha Country Club, and I, you know, you're thinking, God, they really want my kid. Uh, this ought to be a profitable day. Uh, you know, it technically would have been NIL before there was NIL, should I be fortunate enough to win. But uh, I was not fortunate enough to win. Uh, I felt like I got double teamed actually that day, um, but uh, we had a great day. And and it was at that time, you know, I was still coaching at Iowa State, so that was Doug's first exposure to Creighton. Uh, and you know, obviously, he really liked it. So when I ended up taking the job, he got out of that Northern Iowa deal, and the rest is history. And Brian was saying that you do share with them kind of the groundwork that you were saying that that Dana laid there. What specifically did he do? I know you were kind of watching it from afar, but th those imprints that you still see now in the program? I mean, he, he recruited the right kind of guys. And, you know, and and there was a culture of family in his program then. And you can tell that because a lot of his former players, a bunch of them live in Omaha, or they're constantly coming back to Omaha for our games or in the summertime, and they're stopping by the practice facility. Um, the former players don't do that unless they enjoyed their experience, unless they were treated the right way. And obviously, they had success, and, and that certainly helps. Um, but, you know, Dana did it with team after team. You know, he'd lose guys and, you know, uh, but, you know, Kyle Corver, you know, and Anthony Tolliver, the, you know, the two guys, the most recent guys from Dana's tenure that played in the NBA, um, what better representatives of an institution and of a program um, than Kyle Corver and Anthony Tolliver. And, you know, that I think that gives you a snapshot into the type of people Dana brought to in, into Omaha, into the Creighton program. Left middle. Uh, Will Graves, AP. Um, would you be in favor of any sort of potential review system on fouls, maybe particularly late in games, or are the games already sort of drawn out enough that, you know, the call's the call and that's it? <clears throat> You know, I'd probably, uh, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, you know, I understand why you're asking. Uh, I saw the play last night. Um, I, I would probably want to talk to the NBA guys and, and get a feel from them on whether they like it, don't like it. Um, it seems like we go to the monitor a lot the way it is right now, and we're trying to figure out a way to kind of keep our game moving along and uh, make it more fan friendly. And would that slow it down potentially? I mean, you know, we all have video on the bench that's instantaneous, basically. So when we go to a challenge, we pretty much already know the answer. Um, but, you know, it, are we going to challenge traveling? Are we going to challenge? I mean, what, what's next? Where does it stop? I mean, there, there's always been a human element in the game. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't think we want three robots out there running around officiating the game. So. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd want to. I'd want to talk to some of our peers in the NBA to figure out if it's been if they feel like it's been a good thing for their game. Anything that'll improve the game, absolutely. Um, but let's let's give it some thought first. Back right. Matt Prem, twenty four seven Sports. You called Oregon an un, under grossly seeded team. Um, I, I don't know how far back in the scout you went, but what are the, the traits that you're seeing to, to have that kind of feeling for this team? Uh, well, I, you know. Uh, Kuznard and, and Shellstead are playing at a high level, um, and and the, you know Dante's the he's the difference maker, right? When he when he's on the floor, he just he he commands so much attention on the offensive end because you can't you can't guard him one on one, and we've got one of the best defenders in the country, and I'm not sure we can guard him one on one. And then you know defensively, he he sits back there and he he him, him back shots and like Kalkbrenner, there's you know there's the shots you block, there's the shots you change, which don't show up on a stat sheet, and the ones that really don't show up in the stat sheet are the ones you don't take because he's there, and he has that impact on on their opponents. And 
you know, Arizona's a heck of a team. I think they're a team that's got a chance to be a Final Four team. And, uh, you know, that 12, 15 minute stretch from the end of the first half till eight minutes left in the game, they just dominated Arizona. And, uh, and I think you saw that on display again yesterday. Run right. Matt, could you maybe compare the, the mood, the feeling at this stage right now compared to exactly where it was last year going into that into that Baylor game? And maybe there's still the feeling of, hey, we got to really break through and get to the Sweet 16. I know you'd been to one before that, but like, how does it feel right now with the past success that you had last year? Yeah, you know, I, I think every year is different. Um, the hard thing to do is to get here, and then you then you just take it a game at a time, and you try to get through that first one and survive. And uh, and you know then you have two long days of prep, and you're trying to get to the second one. So I, I don't think I don't think our guys feel any pressure to get back to Sweet 16 or an Elite Eight or a Final Four. I think their focus has been let's let's let this thing rip, let's give it our best shot and let's see if it's good enough. And if it is, great. Uh, if it's not, we've got nothing to hang our head about. We've had a heck of a year and done a lot of great things. So, um, and, and frankly, I don't want them to feel that pressure. That pressure, that type of pressure is only going to be a, a hindrance to where we're trying to go. Uh, it's not going to help us. That's for fans to think about, but we can't, uh, we can't think about that in our locker room. Left aisle. James Crepe with the Oregonian. Greg, a bit of a two-parter on, on each end. Defensively, what is it about their matchup zone that's a unique challenge compared to others? And offensively, what is it about the pick and roll with Kuznard and Dante that, yes, they're very old players, a 25-year-old guard and, and a fifth-year center, but what is it about their connection that makes theirs a, a difficult aspect when so many teams run pick and roll? Yeah, you know, the matchup, uh, a lot of teams, there, there are some teams that we've played against uh, in our league that play it. But it's more, they play it more as a changeup. Um, and because they play it more as a changeup, the amount of time they probably commit to it in practice is probably minuscule compared to what their, their other defenses are. Um, it's an important part of Dana's defensive plan. It always has been, you know, ever since I first coached against them in 2001. Uh, so 23 years I've seen it. it it's, it's an important part of what they do. And as a result, their, their guys are really good at it. Um, you know, there's there's not uh, there's not a pattern to it that you can unlock. Uh, it's it's elite communication. It's it's great length. It's covering each other. Uh, it's communication um, that makes it really good. And then, oh by the way, if we make a mistake, we got Dante back there at the rim. So that's what makes that really good. And then um, the ball screen. You know, I, I think Cousinard is is one of the best that I've seen in the country in a ball screen situation, and we call it a hostage dribble, where you get the guy in your back and kind of keep him there and then read a situation. Uh, he's strong enough, he's physical enough, he's crafty enough to get a guy in his back and then decide, am I going to dump it to Dante? I'm going to go it into my mid-range? Am I going to try to get to the rim? Uh, and you have to respect the three-point shot at the point of the ball screen. So it's not like you're going to jump under the screen uh, <clears throat> because you know, he can light you up with a three-point shot. And then Dante's such a physical roller, um, and he can get behind the defense, and you can lob it up to him. So, you know, you, you, you're trying to commit to Cousinard and slow him down, but in the back of your mind, i got to get back to the rim or we're going to get dunked on. Um, so, you know, they're, they're elite at it. And, you know, we, you know, we've got some guys, Trey Alexander, Ryan Kalkbrenner, are pretty good at it, too. They've been together a long time, and they've done it. And like Cousinard, Trey has that mid-range game and the shiftiness to do some different things. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely a problem, and you know I'm not sure if we had five days to prep. It's going to look any different than it will tomorrow, uh, but uh, you know we'll give it our best shot. All right, last question, right aisle. Frame twenty four seven sports. I don't know how many teams in the country like yours do have four guy, three guys that average four or more assists. Can you just speak to the playmaking ability that you guys have and how that's impacted your offense being one of the best in the country? It, it's what we build our program on. <clears throat> you know, we, we may not have as many guys uh, that touch the top of the square as some other teams we're going to play, especially this time of the year. Uh, we, we value skill. Uh, we want guys that can handle it, pass it, shoot it, and understand how to play the game. And then we'll, we'll help you with the other stuff. Um, and guys come into our program understanding that we're, you know, we talk about it in recruiting, like we are going to turn a good shot into a great shot. 
And you know, the last thing you want to do is be the only guy on the team that's willing to turn a good shot into a great shot because it never comes back to you. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, our offense is such that it, the, the ball will find you if you play the right way. If, if you move the basketball, you make the extra pass, you, you, you cut with pace, you, you stay spaced at times when your teammates are in action, our offense will reward you because the ball will find you. Uh, so it's really intentional in recruiting uh, that we have guys that are m more than willing to make that pass. Uh, it's, it's what we built the program on and what we will continue to build it on moving forward. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. Somebody made a mess over here. <laughs> Make sure, make, make sure Dana sits here. <laughs> Oregon student athletes are up next, 220. Years of college for this, man. Blended right in.
just a friendly reminder, cell phones should be turned off or put on silent, and that flash photography is not permitted. Hammond Communications is providing the video feed, which will be available on FTP site found on the NCA Media Hub. Therefore, no video cameras are permitted, including cell phones or tablets. Thank you for your cooperation. Also, the locker rooms to interview the players not on stage will be open for 30 minutes during this press conference period. Also, transcripts are provided by ASAP. It will be posted online and printed in the media workroom. Okay, we are here with Oregon student-athletes Jackson Shellstan and Jermaine Kusnard. We have up to 20 minutes with the student-athletes before head coach Dana Altman. Please raise your hand to ask a question and someone with the microphone will come over. Please state your name and media affiliation. If you're joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We will address questions in the room first and get to Zoom if time allows. Okay, questions for the student-athletes. Left middle. Will Graves, Associated Press. Jermaine, what was the feeling like yesterday? You know, obviously being that efficient, you know, having that kind of performance. And do you, are you a kind of player that kind of goes through hot stretches, cold stretches? 
What do you do to try to keep what happened yesterday go going moving forward? Uh, it's just how the game flows. Uh, I feel like my teammates just put trust into me. And I feel like it depends on how, how the game going. Like, I feel like any one of us guys can get it going. I feel like yesterday was just my night. So it's just not about me. It's about my team. So whatever they need for me to do for us to get the win, that's what I'm going to do. Questions for student athletes. Left. Tom Withers, AP. Jermaine, is grandma coming back? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck, Charm. Yeah. What was her reaction to how it went for you yesterday? Oh, it was amazing. I, I got to see her. Well, I really didn't see her like before the game. So I, I just noticed it. I just put it on my list, uh, my ticket list, just in case she come. Because I was like, my dad just told me. So obviously, I kind of heard her like while I was warming up. But I really didn't. I was so locked in, I didn't really pay attention to her. So at the game, I was able to sit down and talk to her. So it was kind of cool. Yeah, Jermaine, kind of going off that, how many games had she been able to go to before last night? Uh, none. She don't like flying, so this is the only closest place like, she can uh, get to. So they uh, just drove. And I told her, like, uh, one day we're going to have to do something, like, <laughs> drug you up, do something to get you to fly. But she she wouldn't do it. So it was, it was cool. Just to, my first time in March Madness and her first game. So that was dope to me. How often do you get to talk to her after games when she's at home watching yeah, yeah. from every home? Yeah, every day. Every game, I feel like, or well, if it's not the night, because we play at a different time zone in Oregon, so she would probably call me the next morning. But after every game, like good or bad, I'll talk to her for sure. Right back. Jackson, last night was the latest instance of you hitting some, some free throws late in the game to help kind of put it away. You had some instances of that last week. I just. Just start off as a freshman, what it's like kind of being on this stage and, and getting comfortable in this atmosphere, but then also being put in those situations a few times the last couple of weeks and, and being able to come through for your team as a young guy. Uh, I mean, definitely something, you know, I've been getting used to. Um, but, you know, I just try to keep my confidence and my teammates and coaches, you know, do a really good job just uh, instilling that in me every day at practice and in the game. So. I mean, when I'm out there, you know, I don't feel like shaky really because I know they trust me and um, I just got to deliver. Questions for student athletes right here, here to the left. I know you guys would have been 10, 12 years old when your coach was at Creighton and then came to Oregon. But if you guys got an idea from him or just social media or anything like that about how much this game means to him, maybe not revenge, but just the, the personal connections that he has to playing Creighton. Jackson was. Uh, uh, he kind of uh, gave us like a little heads up, like what Creighton kind of mean to him. So I, I kind of feel him. I, I know he did more years at Creighton, right? Than he did at Oregon. So of course, is he had feelings for them. Like he said, he watched the game. He still connect with, like he still watch their game to this day. So I feel like it, it just mean more. Just like when it's time to battle, it's time to battle. So I feel like, of course, he, he's going to want to win, of course. So I feel like that's that's something that we got to install just to help him be at peace with just by winning tomorrow for him. Jackson, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, obviously, this game is going to mean a lot to him. And, uh, you know, he's there for a long time. And, you know, I think he still has a lot of ties with Creighton. I know his family still lives out there. So, you know, he probably have a lot of people you know, like family and friends out here for this game. But, uh, you know, we just want to get the win for him and, you know, for our team, you know, just move on. Right back. Jackson, as a, as a facilitator offensively, when a guy's having a night like Jermaine is having last night, mm. how does that impact you at all, the way you're distributing the ball, running, helping run the team, anything like that? I mean, it's easy for me because I just got to get him the ball and get out the way. Uh, I mean, but. You know, he, he got really high, and, uh, you know, he's super competitive. And when somebody says something on the other team, you know, us on our team, you know, we know not to say anything to Jermaine because that's what gets him going. So that was a bad idea. But, uh, you know, so after that, uh, he started getting – he got it rolling. So we just, you know, got him the ball, and uh, he, he was hot. So he was – yeah, he carried us. Right middle. Uh, Justin Guerrero, Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Jermaine, after you guys finished yesterday, after you got your 40, uh, Oakland had a pretty crazy upset of uh, Kentucky. One of their players, Jack Golke, uh, 
super insane performance, 10 three-pointers, finished one short of the, the NCAA tournament all-time record. I'm, I'm wondering just, uh, this has been something that's kind of just taken social media, college basketball by, by storm. Uh, had you did you see any of that? Um, uh, heard any of that? Yeah, yeah. I, I watched the game last night because, uh, of course, the guy that recruited me to come to Oregon, he coached at Kentucky now. So uh, that was the game I was kind of like watching. So just see, but it was amazing to <laughs> see him shoot the ball like that yesterday. Do you find? Are you guys, you in particular, do you just get so locked in uh, yeah. that you're really only like able to focus on yourself, or can you take a little bit of a step back, watch like a crazy individual performance like that? Yeah, and, of just, course. and just appreciate it. Of course, I'm a basketball guy, man. I, it don't matter what type of basketball it is, women's, uh, men's, I like watching basketball. So it was like, it was just a kind of crazy game just seeing a guy just like shoot the ball that well against a high competitive team like that and just him not backing down, just him showing his competitive spirit, just being an underdog. And that's kind of our story here. So that was kind of cool seeing. Far right. Matt Prem, 24 7 Sports. Jermaine. What's the keys that you're looking at for the pick and roll with you and Dante? It's such a basic play that you're taught at second grade, right. and yet you guys have been so effective with it this season that few teams can stop it. What are the things you're looking for to, to make that play effective? Um, it just they, the defenders have to be honest. So either they're gonna step step stop me from getting downhill, which I'm kind of great at, and then if they help in, I got these two guys that's around me to shoot the ball. So it's kind of like. Oh, and then if they step up, I could dish it off to Dante, which he affected that, which he really don't kind of miss. Like, he kind of ended his streak <laughs> yesterday with uh, missing a couple of shots that I was mad at him about. But even though he had a great game, still just missing three shots. But I feel like he could have went 12 for 12 again. So it's kind of like, well, it's a kind of hard thing to guard when it's two players like that and you got players around you that can really shoot the ball. So Far left. Tom Withers, AP, for both you guys. Uh, Coach McDermott from Creighton called you guys grossly underseeded, which is a compliment. Now that you're healthier and Dante's playing the way he is, is this the version of the Ducks that you guys thought you would be? Oh, yes. oh Jimmy, you want to start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we would, we're not even, like like you say, it's three three players that still sin, uh, particularly four. Just, they still sin, sin, sin down on the bench, so we don't, we're not even at full strength for it which we could have been in the top 25 easily in the country this year. So, But I just feel like our players just took on the road that we had and just like embraced it, like just embraced that we had to do more for us to get where we want to go. And I feel like we did a great job of doing that this year and just, just keep competing. That's all it is. For sure. No, I think everybody, you know, is just kind of buying in at the right time and um, everybody's kind of just figured out their right role towards the end of the season. And, you know, we had to come into the Pac-12 and win three games in a row, obviously. and. We've just also been playing with like more hunger, it seems like, recently. Um, coming out with an edge on our, like, chip on our shoulder. So we just got to keep playing the same way. Far right. Jermaine, you've had big moments. This team's had big moments. And you've always been quick to get past that and immediately focus on the next game at hand. I'm, I'm curious, just at, at what point last night did you stop celebrating the 40-point moment? game and and turn your attention to tomorrow's game uh it's kind of hard just because you see yourself everywhere just strolling on it's like any social media but it's just like coach said once he handed us out to scouting reports it was time to lock in on our next opponent and that that's what i like i'm focused on I'm, the game is past us that's that was a wonderful game for us but i feel like we, we're not done yet we got more to accomplish questions for our student athletes left middle Guys, I'm doing a story on the hype guys, the handshake guys at the end of the lineup line. I talked to Gabe uh, on Wednesday, I think. What kind of energy does that bring to the team and the, the, the guys in that role? And I mean, especially for somebody like him, you know, obviously he's a walk on. He's, you know, this, I guess it's a gig that's sort of handed down right. as guys move on. I mean, what do you, how important are guys like that to have as part of your group and what do they bring to the, uh, to the collective? Like I said, like every basketball team got locker room guys. You got some guys that don't even play, but they're great teammates. So they, like he's one of those guys. You see him like he work out like he's a starter. Like he play forty minutes, thirty minutes every day. Like he st he stays in shape. He lifts mm -hmm. every day. He he does the right thing to be a right teammate. He never down like on himself no matter what. He never brings his personal problems. So it's like he like I told him every day. Like everybody on this team played a big part of why we got here. So even if it's just clapping or just encouraging players. And I feel like he played a big role in that, which he, like, he's a good player. So 
I feel like we he 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 played a big key to our team. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, everybody on this team is uh, very important and has a role. And you know, Gabe's one of our, our most vocal guys. You know, he's a senior. Right. He's been in the program for a long time, longer than anybody. Him and Dante in this program. So I mean, you know, he knows uh, the ins and outs and. Uh, everything we do here, so uh, he's a great leader, one of our great leaders, and um, no, we just love having him. All right, Jackson, you've been thrust into a role where you had to play a bunch of minutes, and you've had to be really good for this team as a freshman. And Dana earlier this year said that was kind of they're hoping you maybe grow into that role, but they weren't just gonna have to give it to you, and they had to. I'm just curious how you've been able to manage the high pressure, the high stress. You always seem pretty calm and collected on the floor. How, how, where does that come from? How, how would we be able to develop that as a freshman? I mean, I don't really look at it like as pressure or, I mean, like big moments. I just kind of go out there and play, you know, just it's what I've been doing my whole life, playing basketball. So, I mean, it's not new, you know, just at a higher stage now. But, um, you know, I just uh, trust my work, but also uh, my teammates and coaches, I trust them and we all trust each other. So it just makes it easier when I'm out there playing. Um, so, yeah, I don't really get, like, shaky in the moment. Well, I got time for one more. Questions for our student athletes? All right, we're good. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Okay, once again, please raise your hand to ask a question. Someone with the microphone will come over. Please state your name and media affiliation. If you're joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We will address the questions in the room first and get to Zoom if time allows. Any questions for Coach Altman? Left, left, left back first, yep. Uh, Tom Withers, Associated Press. Dana, is your seat wet? Because uh, McDermott left something for you there. What's that? <laughs> No He's, idea what you're talking he, about. He spilled water all over there. Oh, said, is that right? He said to make sure you sat there. So, yeah, I think it's dried off. <laughs> I don't know. So he had uh, a lot of great things to say about you, obviously, and talked about a, a golf game years ago when you were recruiting his son, et cetera. Can you just talk about the relationship that you've had with him over the years? Well, he's a really good guy, really good basketball coach, and uh, a lot better golfer than I am. So, um, no, I. Love the job he's done at Creighton. Um, you know, it's so good to watch from afar. And uh, like I said yesterday, it might be my ego or whatever, but I still feel a part of it. You know, I still cheer for him. Uh, my family's all back in Nebraska. And, you know, Oregon might be one, but Creighton's 1A. And, um, you know, he's been so good to my dad, my brother. So, uh, no, I think the world of he and his family and um, you know he's done a tremendous job and uh, again I'm sure you'd say the same thing is this game's not about us it's about our players and they don't care that I was there my players don't care that I was there <laughs> they, they just want to win so uh, hopefully our guys will be ready and uh, you know we'll play well but Creighton's a, a really good basketball team and really do a lot of great things both offensively and defensively and uh, we're going to have to bring our A game. There's no doubt about it. Left middle. Brooke Pryor, ESPN. Dana, what do you remember about that golf game with Greg? He said that he ended up on the wrong side of a, a cash exchange, that he did not win that one. Well, I, I don't remember it that way. Uh, <laughs> I do remember he, he left his six iron in my in my SUV. But, uh, no, it was it was – 
out at Omaha Country Club and uh, Bruce Rasmussen, the AD, uh, put it together and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. But like I said, I, I think I did clip him that day, but uh, I've seen his game since then. I mean, that was uh, 15 years ago and he's a lot better player than I am. I'm awful and he's pretty good, so. Right middle. Matt Prem, 24-7 Sports. Now that you've had a chance to watch them on film, prepare for them a little bit, what, what stands out about this team and, and the matchup that it presents? Well, I know one thing. I wish I went to watch them at midnight last night because uh, it was a little hard to fall asleep after that. Uh, watched the Drake game, and uh, as soon as that was over, started watching Creighton. And uh, I'll tell you, they're, they're a scary offensive team. They, they shoot some, you know, we're just not used to playing a team that takes 29 threes a game, you know, half their, dang near half their shots. And so it's, it's a different prep, and, you know, in a very short time. Um, they just play so differently than anybody we've played. Uh, maybe Alabama. But that was so long ago. That was, you know, in November, you know, and we didn't have half our team then. So, um, you know, it'll be a different experience for our guys. You really got to stay focused because they can hit you with three threes really quick, you know, and make a nine, 12 point run very, very quickly. So, um, again, they're just, they're different than what we face. I think the teams in the Big East maybe are a little used to playing them, but when they get outside the conference, um, you know, a team that takes that many threes, you know, we just haven't faced. Right aisle. Dana Adam Zalanka, Field Level Media. What do you think about Dante's matchup against, I think, the three-time Big East Defensive Player of the Year? Well, Ryan's a tremendous defensive player. Uh, they play that deep drop coverage, uh, and, uh, you know, he just protects the paint. And uh, he's long, and he's got unbelievable timing. You know, I mean, he just uh, really instincts are good. A uh, little bit like a couple of guys we used to have, Boucher and Bell, that, you know, played around the rim and it just had exceptional timing on blocking shots. And, um, you know, at three a game, he, he, he's the presence in there. And not only the shots that he blocks, but he just he alters so many. So, you know, there's a reason he was three-time defensive player of the year. He's, he's very, very good. And in the Big East, there's a lot of good defensive players. So it tells you how much the coaches think of him. But he is a presence back there. But, you know, Dante's been, you know, as soon as he got himself in shape, you know, he didn't play for us until mid-January. And so, um, you know, he struggled to get himself in shape a little bit. But he's kind of worked himself into shape in games, uh, having to play, you know, 35 to 40 minutes a game. He's, he's kind of worked himself into shape. So it'll be a, a good matchup. You know, Dante will compete. Ryan will compete. Uh, those two, you know, that matchup's, you know, a big part of the game. Right front. Matt DeMarinas, White and Blue Review. If, if, if you don't mind, this is probably going to take you in a couple different directions, but Bruce Masterson here in Pittsburgh, I'm just curious what it means to you to just to have him here, even though he's probably rooting for Creighton. But, I mean – just to have him here and your relationship with him and also Kevin McKenna still on your staff was obviously a big part of helping you build Creighton into what it's become. I'm just curious about the dynamics of those relationships and what those two gentlemen mean to you. Well, you know, uh, Bruce and I have known each other for 30 years. Um, you know, we helped raise each other's kids. You know, we, uh, you know, traveled together, played a lot of golf together. Um, you know, Creighton wouldn't be what Creighton is today without Bruce. I mean, all the buildings that were built, um, you know, all the things that have happened for Creighton Athletics, I feel, you know, Bruce had the biggest part of, of, of that. Um, you know, he built that. And uh, you know, just did a great job. So, again, we are good friends. We remain good friends. I know we'll be cheering for the Blue Jays tomorrow, but uh, uh, you know, a guy that worked at Creighton for forty some years, and um, you know, just did a tremendous job. And 
Kevin, you know, that's one of the reasons, you know, we, we still have such great feelings about Creighton is uh, our relationship with Greg and, and Bruce. But Kevin, you know, is a Creighton grad, you know, and uh, propelled him to the NBA, you know, his, his, his time at Creighton. So Kevin's got, you know, he's a Creighton grad. My son graduated from there, you know, so, you know, there are a lot of ties. But uh, tomorrow, all I care about is my players now. You know, um, it, it's, it's tough to play Creighton. I wish the committee wouldn't have done that. You know, there are other threes we could have played. Um, but they did, and, and so we'll have to play a game. But my focus is on Dante and Jermaine and, and the fellows I got now. And I'm sure, you know, Creighton feels the same way. Right middle. Justin Guerrero, Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Dana, when you spoke with us the other day ahead of South Carolina, if memory serves, uh, I think you told us you saw some shades of UCLA, maybe Wazoo in there, just comparatively. Uh, curious, uh, anyone in the Pac-12 that uh, that you see similarity-wise to Creighton that's maybe aided in, uh, in prep? Not really. Um, as I mentioned, the 29 threes, we don't, we don't face anybody that, you know, is that... Uh, three ball dominated um you know the most explosive offensive team in our league is arizona and uh, but they play a lot differently but they you know can get it going from three when we played them at their place they they got it going from three and and gave us fits and uh if creighton starts hitting them like they did that day you know they'll give us fits also but uh we we don't really have an offensive team or a defensive team that plays like them and that's why you know part of the prep is different and uh, and difficult because you know putting four shooters out there five when Ryan's hitting them from the top and um, guy bring off the bench can shoot it you know so yeah it's it's a different prep different team far right Dana I don't know how many teams in college basketball this season have three guys that average four or more assists like Creighton does what how much does that playmaking ability on their roster lead to their offense being one of the best in the country? Well, you know, one of the most underrated skills in, in basketball is passing and catching the ball. And they got a lot of good passers, and they catch the ball and move it really well. And they're ready to shoot it, you know, when they do pass it. Um, but they're a very good passing and catching team, and, and that creates a lot of problems. And they've got the floor spread so much because all of them can shoot it that it creates gaps. There's, it's hard to help, you know, and, and hard to get in those gaps because if you leave those shooters too much, you know, they, they've got an open look. And then Alexander's so good at getting in the seams and, and making plays. So uh, they're, there's a reason they're a three seed and ranked in top ten or wherever they're ranked, you know, they – they may make plays for each other. And the other thing, you know, you look at their stats, they've started the same guys all year. You know, I looked at that, 33 starts, 33 starts. They're used to playing with each other. You know, and they got those three guys back from a year ago, their core. Um, and, you know, they're just, they make plays for each other. And, again, they've, they've got their six-man, seven-man rotation. Um, they've all been there all year. They've all played all the games. And, they do a great job of knowing where each other's going to be, and they run their stuff, and it's really good stuff. So, no, they're offensively they're a handful. Defensively, their numbers are good, and and that's why I said we're going to have to bring our A game. We're going to have to play very well. Far right, James James Carpe of the Oregonian. Dana, this matchup obviously allows for a little bit of nostalgia and looking back. When you took over in, in year one here, what was the culture you were trying to instill? with a group that you inherited. And when that 2011 CBI matchup and that three game series happened, how much did that challenge after a year, some of that culture? Because here you're playing, playing your former team and your former players are playing you and all that. So after that year of building, how did that CBI matchup play into things? Well, I remember really is, um, you know, they had so many of the players that, you know, had left uh, Kenny Lawson and Ethan Rogge and Gregory and Antoine, uh, Josh Jones, um, you know, those guys that all played for me, you know, the year before. So, you know, that's tough. 
um, playing those guys. And, you know, I think the word culture is overused. Um, you know, there were certain things we were trying to establish, you know, that, uh, that we wanted as a coaching staff. But I think, you know, the personality of your team changes year to year. Um, you know, there's certain needs that your team has that as a coaching staff you try to provide. You know, there's certain things you talk to your leaders about that you think are, are really important. Um, you know, competing and, you know, the parts of the game that you want to emphasize because you can't emphasize everything. You know, Creighton does a great job of emphasizing three-point shooting, uh, not fouling. You know, they don't create a lot of turnovers. They're, they're just pack it in and let Ryan block shots. You know, and that'll change once Ryan graduates. You know, they'll, they'll change a little bit. Um, so there's a certain way that every coach wants to play the game. Uh, there's certain things work ethic-wise, competitiveness-wise, that you want to instill in your program. Um, and, and getting your team to believe those things when you got a lot of guys coming in every year uh, sometimes takes a while. Um, you know, sharing the basketball. When everybody that, you know, they trust, their parents and their AAU coach and everybody they know is telling them to shoot it every time they get it. And uh, uh, so, you know, you just – you go through those ups and downs every year. You try to get guys to believe the same things you believe. And uh, back in 10-11, um, we were just trying to get guys to compete the way we wanted to play. You know, we, were, we had a lot of guys, so we were pressing and doing some of the things we like to do. And, um, and so a long time ago, James, but, uh, you know, I, I can remember the first year – was just trying to get the guys to trust me a little bit because, you know, here's a guy from, you know, Nebraska coming, you know, and I hadn't been in the Pac-12 or anything. And uh, so it wasn't like, you know, I was coming in as their first choice. You know, as I said, I think I was maybe 38 or 39 on the list. And uh, so, you know, the first year was trying to get them to trust me and trying to get them to compete at the level we wanted to. And, um, try to lay foundation that we were going to play a certain way. But uh, it was a long time ago, but it was a tough game. I, I remember playing the games. I hated it because, you know, I, Kenny Lawson and Josh and those guys, Antoine, you know, those guys that still stay in touch with. I still get Texas from, you know, when we win a game at Cre or at, at Oregon, I still get Texas from my Creighton guys. So, um, you know, that was, that was a tough series. And, and following with that thing, in an era where a dozen plus teams pass up on playing in the NIT, let alone the CBI these days, what did a player like a Javon Cadron mean to you? Where you inherit that guy, and that's where you ended up in year one. But that was about competing, and a guy like you rattle off all these names of guys from here and there who were your guys. When you're trying to instill a culture like that, would you would that player even exist today? Javon was unbelievable. We we went to one any games that first year. Uh, he and EJ and Garrett Sim were, were unbelievable. Um, I remember the meeting. Uh, we, we played well in the uh, Pac-10 tournament at that time. We, we beat uh, uh, Arizona State in the first round, beat UCLA in the second round, and, and gave Washington a, a good game in the, in the semis. Um, and so it was Sunday afternoon, and we knew we weren't getting an NIT or a and uh, the CBI had contacted us, and we had a team meeting. And, and uh, you know, I said, what do you guys think? I said, I, I need at least seven of you, you know, to, that want to play. I want to play. I need at least seven, you know, that will play. And a couple of guys, you know, it was spring break, I remember, and, you know, a couple of guys had made plans. And, uh, you know, they didn't want to play. And Jovan looked at them, stood up, and said, if I got a chance to put Oregon across my chest one more time, I'm doing it. And that ended the discussion. Everybody, okay, he's going. But it was really emotional. He just stood up and said, hey, if I got a chance to put Oregon across my chest one more time, I don't care where it is, I'm doing it. And, uh, you know, that's what I knew one guy believed. And, um, um, you know, the rest of the guys, EJ and Garrett, they wanted to play too, don't get me wrong. But someone had to stand up and say it. And... Um, 
you know, Joe Vaughn did. And, you know, he's still in town and he still follows our program. And I still get texts from him all the time uh, about keeping the guys going. When we don't play well, I get a text from him too. What the heck's going on? And uh, just like, but you want your former players to be engaged like that, you know? Um, so, but no, he, he meant the world to us that first year, no doubt. Tom over here on the left. Tom Withers, AP again. Dana, uh, I was just wondering if you've met Jermaine's grandma yet, and are you going to make sure that she's around for the ride as long as it lasts? No, I, I met her last night, and I told her, where the heck have you been? Um, you know, we, she doesn't like to fly, and uh, if I'd have known that, we'd have had a bus pick her up in Chicago and drive her all the way out to Eugene. Uh, no, I did meet her last night, and, uh, you know, that's one of the great things that you get to see. You know, Jermaine was there with – aunts and uncles and dad and mom and grandma and there's a whole table of them enjoying dinner and uh you know I, and grandma had a big smile so that was one of the great things you get to see and that's a night he'll never you know never forget his grandma and mom family will never forget um so but yeah if i'd have known that result was coming we could have got her to the games a lot quicker so we got time for two more Right here to the right and right behind you. Go. Uh, Matt DeMarino, Spike Miller. I actually have two. One's light, though. Uh, Antoine, after you guys got the win yesterday, tweeted out that he's got a lot of love for you but still bitter about the over and back violation. I'm wondering how many times he, has he brought that up to you over the years since it's since it went down? Oh, not much. Um, <laughs> you know, there for a couple of years they they were upset about it, but I, I, time kind of wore off. Um, but, uh, no, Antoine, you know, played a lot for me as a freshman and, mm -hmm. and uh, did a great job, uh, you know, for Greg. But, uh, and he's in coaching now, yeah. so it's kind yeah. of exciting to, to see him get his career started and uh, try to get going. Uh, a basketball one, if you don't mind. Uh, the, the, the kind of the origin of your belief in the matchup zone when you went to it, um, I mean, ever since – Kyle and Rodney were at the tip of your press. It's kind of been your base. Like, what, 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 what intrigued you about it, and why has it been a staple of what you do defensively? Do you think? Well, I mentioned when we went to Creighton, you know, we were not very good, um, and so we felt like we had to play differently than all the other teams in the league. And um, um, nobody pressed, and you know, nobody was playing that way. Um, so we. You know, we, we couldn't keep up with that time, Illinois State, Bradley. Uh, those programs were really good. And we knew we couldn't match them just playing man-to-man, -man, you know, playing straight up. So uh, we went to some presses and, you know, some zones to to just throw them a curve. You know, our fastball wasn't good enough. It's the analogy I always use with the team. You know, fellas, uh, a lot of guys can hit the fastball. Some can't hit the curve. So, you know, we've got to have some different pitches. And... Uh, um, I've, you know, I just feel like it gives us something else. And, and right now when our numbers aren't quite the same, you know, chasing somebody around in our press or even man-to-man -man for 40 minutes, uh, you know, when you're trying to play guys 38 minutes is, is pretty tough. And so uh, we've changed some things up and, and uh, try to use the zone a little bit. Um, you know, tomorrow will be tough. You know, when they when they can spread the floor with all those shooters, you know, uh, it's usually convenient if one or two guys can't shoot it, then you can, you know, get in the lanes a little bit more and crowd things up. But when you got a team that can spread the floor like them, I don't know how much zone we'll be able to play. Last one, far right. Dana, the pick and roll has been such a huge play for, for you guys offensively, yet it's one of the most basic plays in basketball down to youth level. Why has it been so effective to you when it, it's such a common practice in, in this sport? Well, you know, a lot of times you get away with illegal picks, you know. Um, and um, so I'm always complaining that on the defensive end, but on the offensive end, it's, it's part of it. But no, I mean, if you have guys that can spread the floor, and you got a guy that can make good decisions, uh, it's tough to guard. Uh, if you extend your defense and try to double or hedge it hard, and you got a good playmaker, good passer, he can make plays. Um, you know, 
know, Creighton's got Ryan to go to the rim and they can throw it up to him anytime, which is going to make it very difficult. And uh, our pick and roll offense got a lot better when, when we had Dante to throw it up to. So, you know, it's all the guys want to do it because that's all they see in the NBA, you know, and um, I'd, I'd like them to be a little bit more uh, concerned about their passing and catching and making some better cuts. But, you know, it's such a big part of the NBA that guys want to do it, guys want to work on it. Um, and it is hard to guard. You know, you get a good guard that, that can break a defense down and you got a guy that you can throw it to the goal to. Um, it's a very tough defensive assignment. Thanks, Coach. All righty.
Just a friendly reminder, cell phones should be turned off or put on silent. And that flash photography is not permitted. Hammond Communications is providing the video feed, which will be available on the FTP site found the NCA Media Hub. Therefore, no video cameras are permitted, including cell phones or tablets. Thank you for your cooperation. Also, locker rooms to interview players not on stage will be open for 30 minutes during this press conference period.
Okay, we're here with Oakland student athletes DQ Cole and Jack Golke. We have up to 20 minutes with the student athletes before head coach Greg Campy. Please raise your hand to ask a question and someone with the microphone will come over. Please state your name and media affiliation. If you are joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We will address the questions in the room first and go to Zoom if time allows. Questions for the student athletes. Left middle. Brooke Pryor, ESPN. Jack, I think you said last night that you probably weren't going to check your phone. You turn it off multiple hours before the game. But what have the last, I mean, 20 or so hours been like for you? How do you stay locked in with all of the, I mean, March Madness happening? Yeah, it's it's definitely been crazy. Uh, when I finally did open my phone, it was, it was overwhelming, to say the least, uh, which I definitely appreciate all the support of all the people uh, sending me messages and things like that. It means a lot. But uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of just putting it all off until Sunday. Um, I, r I really want to win this next game, and I know my guys do as well. So I just got to kind of put it away and, and, and forget about my phone for the next 48 hours, and then we'll take care of it. Back left. Jack Will Graves, Associated Press. I did some calling around about you this morning. I talked to Coach Tharp. I talked to, to Kevin. How difficult was the decision to leave? I, they said that you had exhausted your options academically. And they said that you came to them almost like asking for permission in a way to leave. How difficult was it? And, and what are you what, what are you studying this year? Yeah, so I got my accounting undergrad at Hillsdale, and I'm doing my master's of business uh, right now. Uh, so I'll be done with that this summer. And it was it was really tough. Uh, you're kind of they're right. I was kind of asking for their permission, even though they were very gracious and they weren't going to say no or anything like that. But um, I loved my time at Hillsdale. It was amazing. Five amazing years. Um, obviously different than this. This is really, really awesome too, but um, I made some tremendous relationships with the coaches and players, some of my best friends. Um, so I can't say enough good things about them. So I, I didn't really want to leave, but um, they don't have graduate school programs for uh, business-related stuff, and I knew I wanted to do that in my, uh, in my future. And I knew I wanted to keep playing basketball and challenge myself at the next level. So it made too much sense not to try to jump up to Division One here. And, and everything is, has worked out pretty well so far. Front right. Uh, Jeff Nyberg from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Jack, I'm not sure what the last six months maybe looked like, but if, have you had any random or weird NIL offers in the last 12 hours or so? And what did those look like? Um, to be honest, I've, I've definitely gotten a lot of messages but I haven't, I just haven't been able to comb through them. And um, like, I, yeah, I want to make money. I want to go through them. But um, I care more about winning the next game. So like I said, hopefully those opportunities will still be there on Sunday. And I can, I can figure that out. But to be honest, for now, I've, I've only looked at like one or two things. Left middle. I mean, kind of along those lines, what has the most surreal moment been of, you know, since the game, and I know you were on the McAfee show this morning, but of all those things, what kind of jumps out as, wow, I can't believe this is happening? Uh, it, was, it was probably being on SVP late night. That was really cool, uh, going on with Coach Campy, and uh, I got back to the hotel. It was pretty late, and I turned on the TV, and then I was like, oh, I guess I'll check ESPN right now. And and I saw myself on Scott Van Pelt. So that was, that was pretty cool. It's a show I feel like a lot of people grew up watching and, and seeing him uh, talk about his sports takes. So, so that was something that was really cool. Front left. Guys, Tony Paul, Detroit News. Um, Greg, uh, Greg Campy called the play of the game, the Rocket Watts pass to, to you, DQ. I'm just curious, both of you, um, what you thought of that play. He could have gone to the lane, dr taken a shot himself. He's taken on a different role this year. His career hasn't necessarily gone out, we hope. What do you make of what he means to this team and that play in particular? What does that show about him? DQ, can you start? Uh, definitely. Uh, Rock is just, he's been, he's taken everything in since the beginning of the year. No matter what's been thrown at him, he's been ready for whatever task coach throws at him, whatever, if that's scoring, if that's just coming in, getting a game when it's stopped. That's getting a game when a rebound rocket hasn't he hasn't budged. He's been he's been a great teammate, a great player all year for us. So we 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 expected that out of him. And I was just deep corner. Uh Rob reached and Rocket made the right play. And he believed in me. Everybody on the bench believed in me. All the guys believed in me. I knew I could knock it down. So 
So shout out to Rocket for making that pass for me. Yeah, yeah I just want just want to add to that. Uh, Rocket's my roommate this year, so we we've, we've been through a lot together, and uh, just can't say enough good things about him. Like you said, he's uh, he's had a windy road, as have a lot of us in our basketball careers on this team. But he shows up every day to work. He uh, he does what's asked of him, and he always makes the right play. So he's just another uh, tremendous part of our team. Questions for student athletes. Left middle. Jack, the, the official attendance for Hillsdale's regional final last year was 117. And there were 18,000 people here watching you last night. As a competitor, was there any difference as a basketball player? And did you sort of realize and embrace maybe the immensity of the stage? Uh, one, it's kind of one of those things like once you're out there on the court, you don't, and me personally, I don't really notice what's going on around me. And I think that's important as players. I don't think any of us really notice too much about what's going on. But I will say that yesterday was the first time ever in my career that, especially in the first half towards the end, I noticed like if I caught the ball, like I could just hear the crowd, like kind of co collect their breath. And that I had never noticed that on the court, anything like that, just hearing that big of a crowd, that type of thing go on. That was kind of cool, but also just a surreal experience of everyone's kind of on edge of their seat whenever I touch the ball. Front right. I, I can tell based on the way you've answered most of these questions that you haven't thought about this yet. But <laughs> you're, I don't know where basketball ends up taking you in the future, either of you. But have you thought about at all what maybe it, the future will look like when, when you look back, you, that you, you had these moments and and, and you, were, you knocked off Kentucky and, and made people start questioning a lot of things about Kentucky, and it was you guys who did all that. Yeah, I think, uh, and we've, we've talked about this with Coach Campy. I think when I think about it right now, the thing that I'm most excited about, and this is because of my time at Hillsdale. I, I go back to Hillsdale once or twice, and I'm excited to see my guys. I can't wait to come back and see all these guys in five, ten years, however many years it is, and talk about these memories that we're making right now. And that's why we want to keep making more of them, because we know we're going to get together down the road, and it's going to be just such a fun experience to reminisce. DQ, you want to add to that? Uh, definitely. Uh, just being on this team, ever since we went to Italy, it's just been it's just been love. It's like, I, 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 I would say love at first sight. It was like <laughs> we went to Italy, and it was just, we hit it off from there. Everybody on the team loved each other. And we got this. We got this saying between the players: "Is like we'll die for each other." So it's like anything, whether it's defensive slides, free throw at the end of practice. We may have to run sprints, whatever it is. We're all going hard, and we're all willing to die for each other. And we we take that out on the court, and it shows. Left aisle. Uh, Jack Jerry DePaul, Trip Trip Total Media uh, in Pittsburgh. I was wondering, I was do, walk, looked at the stats this morning. I was wondering, is it written in your scholarship? You're not allowed to shoot. Two pointers, only threes. <laughs> uh, no, it's not in my scholarship. Coach Campy might uh, tell me to stay out of the paint if there's some big, uh, big guys down there. But I've, I've said it a couple times. But I, I told my teammates I used to shoot twos in the past, but they don't believe me. So uh, I don't know how I'm going to change that. But <laughs> I'm, I'm just playing my role, man. The coach does a great job putting us in positions to succeed. And if I play my role, then I know my guys are going to play theirs. Front right. Uh, a question for DQ Cole. Obviously, Jack made a ton of threes. Oh, Neil Rule with Oakland Media, by the way. Uh, Jack made a ton of threes. You made the three uh, that, that really put the game away. But DQ, no one's going to talk about. You had eight rebounds yesterday. Rebounding from the guard spot, it's something that you've done all season long for this Oakland team against a huge backcourt with Kentucky. Where does that come from? Where does, where does, that, where does that dog in you come from? Because rebounding's a want-to proposition. Uh, honestly, it's just... It's just my my natural instinct. Ever since I was a kid, I always I was the smallest, the most unathletic, so I had to make a way to get rebounds. I always wanted the ball. I knew I had to rebound. I knew I had a skill when I was younger. I just didn't I didn't have the work ethic. I didn't know what it took. And just working up working my way up, I learned that I can if I can affect the game in any way that it, it it'll help our team out. So ever since middle school I can say I just been uh, a, a great rebounder. I just a ball tracker. Got to get this rebound. Got to get every rebound. Any rebound that I can get, I got to get it. Especially in big situations like this, March Madness. We need those rebounds to to get good wins against good teams. So, 
then a quick follow-up to that. How does this feel for you being from Pontiac? You know, you can practically walk to, to Oakland's campus from Pontiac. How does this feel for you to be doing this on this stage? Oh, it's crazy. It's a dream come true every day. It's just been, I'm learning new stuff every day. I'm seeing stuff I've never seen before. Jack Gokey, I've never seen that before. I Ever in my life, I've, I've shot with good shooters, but this is by far the greatest shooter I ever shot with. And it's just been surreal, just taking in every moment I can and just just going with the flow, just enjoying it. Left aisle. Cameron Hoover, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. This is a question for you, DQ. DQ. Uh, just kind of being around this guy all season long, what is it sort of like for you and the guys in the locker room now that he's kind of becoming this overnight celebrity from his performance <laughs> last night? Uh, it's crazy. Uh, some of the guys, me and some of the guys were up late last night just – we were just going, we were just on his uh, his Instagram and we were just watching how many followers he just, people just following. He had Antonio Brown and the famous people just, they just in disbelief. It was just amazing to see. But uh, like I said, we all knew this all along. Uh, we've been we've been believing in him since Italy. We know he can shoot the, blo- shoot the ball. We know that he can make any shot out there on the court. So we believe in him. He believes in us. And we're going to continue to believe in him, and he's going to continue to believe in us. Left middle. Jack, one quick one. I know you're from Pewaukee. Do you know the Watt family? Or is that I know that's a decently small area, <laughs> and what are the odds that the Watt family and you're from there? Do you guys have any kind of relationship? Uh, the closest I have is, is uh, like, my mentor growing up. Uh, he's, like, best friends with J.J. Watt, so... I've like met him once or twice, but I wouldn't say I, he really like knows who I am or I really know who he is. But uh, he's obviously a legend from Pewaukee and uh, Wisconsin in general, so uh, it's pretty cool to see like a shout out from him. And then DQ, a couple of days ago, Campy was saying that if you guys won the first game, it would change your lives. It would change his life, Oakland's life. We kind of know how it's starting to change Jacks. How for you are you kind of wrapping your mind around a, a life changing win like that? Uh, I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of, my adrenaline was still kind of pumping. I mean, it was, it was crazy just to be out there, be even being on the bench. Like everybody on the bench was in shock. It was, it was something we knew we could do. It wasn't uh, like we just got lucky or anything like that I would say we we prepared for it uh, we all believed in each other and we went out there and we got the job done but for me I would say it was just just coming from Juco uh, it was just it was it's been a long road so it was just it just felt good to maybe get the biggest win of my life hopefully I can get more to come though Ray metal Nathan Geese, you would say today, this one's kind of for both of you. Uh, life in the mid-major, you guys don't win that conference tournament. You're not here right now, and all of this isn't happening. How do you guys kind of handle and go about your business in that first four months to even get to this point where the second you lose, it's just done? Uh, it's all about just preparation. And uh, Coach Campy just preached, especially during the regular season, it's just stacking hurdles. Um, we had 20 regular season hurdles in the Horizon League. And he just said we had to stack one more than the team, than the next team, and we got 15. I think the next team had 14 or 13. So, so we got that one seed, and that helped us out in the conference tournament. And then once we got to the conference tournament, it was just all about seize the moment like we're trying to do here and, and give ourselves that opportunity to come and make history. Uh, so it's it just the preparation of the whole year, I would say. DQ, you want to add to that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I just think uh, ever since we came in, like I said, our first meeting, it's just been everybody's all in. Nobody's not bought into the system that Co- Coach Campy has, Coach Bobby, Coach Cub, they all, Coach Smitty, they all put a great a great game plan together every day. And we and we execute, we go out there, we, we lock in, and we and we make sure that we're ready for, what, for what's thrown at us because we see a lot of different things out there. And people get confused with our defense so we have to we have to be able to stay on top and and contain left middle jack you know you hit the fifth three last night you stick your tongue out you hit the sixth three you do the jordan shrug you get the last rebound you're screaming and then you come in here and you're like oh hey how's it going no big deal <laughs> is there a jekyll and hyde thing i mean what happens when you get on the floor that maybe it's totally runs in what contrast to what it seems like you are off the uh, I think that's a good way to describe it. I've never thought of it that way, but Jekyll and Hyde's definitely a good uh, good way to put it. Um, I try to just be 
as humble as I can off the court and all this attention. It's it's really cool. Don't get me wrong, but it's it's definitely weird for me. Like like we all know, coming from Division Two, I haven't seen anything like this before. Um, but once I step on the floor, it's it's just a whole different mentality. Of I'm just trying to go out there and and uh, just make the opponent feel my presence. To be honest, and uh, I didn't used to honestly be that that emotional of a player on the court, but I guess I've just developed that in the last couple of years just because of my passion for the game and, and how much I love being out there with my teammates. I'm just trying to soak it all in. And um, I'm sure all of you know I'm pretty old and, and a seasoned veteran in college basketball, so I know I don't have a ton of time left uh, for this specific stage. I obviously want to play pro, but just trying to take advantage of all these moments and, and, uh, and appreciate it, really. we got time for two more back right. Yeah, Rob McLean with Inside Pack Sports. Uh, obviously, NC State, they're kind of on a magic carpet ride like you guys are. I just would like from both of you, if you don't mind, your thoughts on the Wolfpack, what you've seen over the last uh, 24 hours. Dick, you want to start? Uh, they're a pretty good team. They are uh, they got some big, solid guys inside. The guard the guard play is pretty decent. Uh, but I know um, I know our coaches, our coaching staff will put a good, put together a good game plan to, to stop or at least limit uh, most of their most of their good players and try to get them to miss some shots and we're gonna we're gonna hope we keep hitting shots and moving up. Jack? Yeah, um we, we watched our film today and, and uh I know us as players will watch some more film tonight, but uh I mean just seeing seeing Burns how how much of a force he is, we just obviously gotta limit his touches, especially deep in the paint because he's gonna kill us if he catches the ball down there and uh Horn's a, a terrific player too. So we gotta we still need to study up a little bit more on kind of tendencies and things like that, but we've we've put in our, our game plan with our zone. We know uh, kind of what spots on the floor we need to attack when, when they have the ball and, and kind of what their weak spots are. So uh, it's just going to come down to executing the game plan. I think whichever team does that best is, is going to come out victorious. All right, last question, front and left. Brock Heilig with the Oakland Post. Guys, could you just talk about what a Sweet 16 appearance would mean for you guys as players, Campy as the coach, and the program in general? Dick, you want to start? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it'll be crazy, not only for uh, for our basketball careers, but for obviously for Coach Campy's career. Uh, and then I think we I think we all deserve it. Coach Campy, Coach Campy believes in us. He's been believing in us. And we all believe we deserve it. So once, like Jack said yesterday, if we win, it won't be a surprise to us because we, we've prepared for this ever since our non-conference schedule way back in November, October. So, yeah, uh, it'll be it'll be a great feeling. Jack? Yeah, we're, we're super excited for the opportunity. And uh, like DQ said, uh, us as players, we want to go out and get it for the guy next to us and for Coach Campy uh, because we know how much time and effort he's put into Oakland University, and, and he deserves it more than anyone. But also just the school and – the amount of support we've gotten as a team this year has been really cool to see. And uh, a lot of us, like DQ, coming from JUCO, me from Division Two, other guys from JUCO, things like that, uh, we didn't have that type of stuff necessarily at our other schools. So getting that kind of love and, and hoping we can reciprocate it with a, something special like a trip to the Sweet 16, it would be really awesome. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. down here. I don't have COVID. Don't spoil your <laughs> we had that happen earlier. All right. Please raise your hand to ask a question and someone with a microphone will come over. Please state your name and media affiliation. If you're joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We will address questions in the room first and get to Zoom if time allows. Okay. Questions for Coach Campy. Left aisle. 
Cameron Hoover, Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Uh, coach, last night after the game, Jack kind of said, he joked and said something along the lines of, I took some threes maybe I shouldn't have, and you just kind of laughed and shook your head. Uh, do you disagree with that statement? And also, kind of, what is it as a coach that lets you sort of let a player like that play with that kind of freedom to shoot as often as he does? I 100% disagree with it. He hasn't taken a bad shot in of his 380 that he's taken. And what makes a coach do that is probably stupidity. Um, you know, I, I've i always, on my best teams over the, the Division I years, in the Division II days, that's all we had was shooters. In the Division I days, you know, you can't win that way. Um, so we always wanted to have two, and one had to be unconscious shooter. And the reason they had to be an unconscious shooter is because my best players are always our post players. It, you know, I, I had score at the basket type guys. So how do you keep those guys from being doubled? You have a guy out there that's unconscious that will shoot anything that by the end of that game, Kentucky had three guys on him. And all of a sudden, Trey Townsend goes from four points at halftime to 17. And if he'd have made his free throws like he normally, I mean, he's a 80% free throw shooter that went four for nine. So, he, he, you know, he would add over 20 points. And, and that just opens it up. And as much as I love the three, our offense's philosophy is the three is third. The first is layups, the second is free throws, and the third is threes. We don't want to take twos. We want to take layups, free throws, and threes. So to do that, if I can have a guy that's an unconscious guy that people think he's nuts, and, you know, and they think Gokey's that. I mean, they, they think he'll shoot any shot any way, and he does, and he makes them. He can go miss four in a row, and I've seen him do that, and I've seen him make four in a row. So, yes, I want him shooting it every time. He can't take a bad shot. Now, have I said to him, did we really need that one? Yeah, but he knows, you know, if he doesn't take one, I'm going to scream at him. Left middle. Brooke Pryor, ESPN. Greg, you have been doing this a long time, but in the last 18 hours, I know, I'm so Why do we have to keep so bringing sorry. all that up, man? Just, you know, context. 40 years. For 40 years. In the last 20, 18 hours, have you experienced anything that you've never experienced in your career before? Any any kind of surreal moments, pinch me moments in the last little bit? Um, the rush of media, um, kind of like this. I mean, this is different because it's Kentucky on the biggest stage. But our first trip to the NSA tournament in 2005, we were – we went into the league tournament as the seven seed, maybe the one of the worst seasons a co team I've ever coached had. We were nine and seventeen or something like that, and uh, we went and we won our conference tournament. We're going to the NCAA tournament for the first time, and when the airplane landed um, to get back to Detroit, in those days you could get by. You know, the media could go anywhere. There was no TSA in that. And we get off the plane and we're walking and there's this barricade and all these cameras and all these people. And I said to my assistant, oh, my God, what happened at the airport? And it was all for us. And I was like, we were dumbfounded by it. I'd never been in anything like that. And as an assistant, I'd been to the Sweet 16 with Toledo. So, you know, I never had seen anything like that. This is parallel to that. I mean, I, I have not been asleep yet. I've not been to bed and I have not been I've not stopped talking. You know, I mean, I, I, I like to talk. I talk a lot, but it's getting ridiculous. You know, I mean, every 15 minutes I've got a Zoom or something. And, but it's really cool, and it's great for Oakland. You know, this is this is just unbelievable for our university, the amount of publicity. And, and because our kids are such great kids, it's positive publicity. Front left. Greg, Tony Paul, Detroit News. Um, Rocket Watts, you said that pass was the play of the game to DQ Cole in the corner. Uh, I'm just curious, can you kind of explain a little bit about what he means to this team and where he's come from, given that this kid started out as a big-time prospect at Michigan State and he came to ended up at Oakland taking on a completely different role. What does he mean to this team? And can you take us through that specific play? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a hell of a question because we don't win last night without him. He didn't play in the conference tournament because of injury. He's been beset with injuries in his two years at Oakland. Um, you know... I know he's disappointed in that the trajectory of his career, you know, looked like an NBA one and done and all that kind of stuff. And now he's, you know, uh, a really important role player. 
but he could be an important role player on a team that does something special. So you know, maybe the tra trajectory isn't as bad as he thinks. And he's accepted it, and he's an unbelievable teammate. Um, the players love him. I heard Golke at a press conference talking, not here, but maybe it was the league tournament or it was somewhere that he's talking. Well, you know what? It was senior night, and he was telling everybody how he was telling all his people at Hillsdale that he's rooming with Rocket Watts, and everybody thought that was the you know unbelievable. You're rooming with Rocket Watts, so you know he's just a great kid that everybody loves. And uh, last night was a special moment for him. I mean, he he got to the rim and made some big baskets for us when we weren't struggling, and then. You know, a, a selfish player that thinks they're really, really good and should shine in the moment would have shot a falling down shot there. And instead, he found DQ in the corner for maybe the biggest basket in Oakland history. Right front. Yeah. Hey, Greg. Tony Garcia, Detroit Free Press. Uh, you say you haven't slept yet. I'm just checking if that's literally or figuratively. And also, when you have all this going on, right, how do you sort of set the tone that, I guess, 27 hours from now, because uh, you said yesterday that wasn't a fluke, right? This isn't just some Cinderella that popped off one day. You guys want to make a run. So how do you dial that, dial back in with all this going on? Well, it's easy, you know, because of how important it is, and and we know what's going on. I mean, I yeah, I haven't I haven't been in bed. I haven't slept. I I got a job. I got you know this is this is, I mean, this is the most important time of the year in this job. And I'm lucky that, what are there, 32 teams left in the country doing it? And there's 360 coaches, and so 300 coaches aren't doing this. So I better do it, and I better do it well. I, own, I owe our players that. I will say this, though. I, between 2 and 4 in the morning, I spent that, those two hours returning text messages because they can't return them at that time. You know, you, you have 1,300 text messages, and you do it in the middle of the afternoon, then they answer, and then you've got to put a thumbs up or a heart on it, you know? And that's now it becomes 2,600 text messages. So I did that at 3 in the morning so that those people wouldn't, you know, I didn't want to keep answering text messages. And I got it down from 1,300. I got it down to about 195. Now it's back up to 495. So, you know, I got to, uh, tonight I'll be up at 2 o'clock in the morning doing the rest of them. Left dial. Uh, Jerry DePaul, Pittsburgh Trib. In this day and age, Coach, how does a guy stay at one school for 40 years? Stupidity, uh, a great, a great athletic director, a president, you know, people that you know put up with you. Uh, nobody else wants you. I mean, uh, there's a lot of answers to that. I, I, five became ten, ten became twenty, and now it's forty, and everybody brings it up. You know, I'm trying to low key that. You know, I, I, I'm trying to tell people I started, I got the job when I was 18. You know. The, I don't know, man. I, I know this. Uh, I have a unique situation, a unique love for a university that's accepted me. I grew up with the university. We went from 9,000 students when I got there to 20. We went from 1,000 on campus to almost 5,000 on campus. It's a, there's been a crane on our campus every year, but the COVID year that I've been there, it's grown. It's an unbelievable campus, an unbelievable university, and it's getting the, the due that it needs now. I mean, people are talking. Our, our university website crashed last night. It crashed. I mean, that's what this does. We also sold $8,000 worth of T-shirts to Louisville last night. Think about that. Honest to God, you know that they they buy the T-shirts and they put the credit card in Louisville, Louisville, Louisville. It wasn't the same person, so I don't know. Next year when Louisville and Kentucky play, I don't know if everybody's going to show up in an Oakland shirt or what. I have no idea, but it's crazy to think about what something like this does. Right aisle. Yeah, Rob McLean with Inside Pack Sports. I know you haven't had a lot of time, but what have you seen studying NC State and uh, what threats I guess do they pose? I've looked at every possession this season that they've played against zone. So not a lot of teams play zone, so that's good. Because otherwise, it, I'd be up three nights, I guess. Um, it's going to be a completely different game plan than we had against Kentucky. At Kentucky, we wanted them to catch the ball at 10 or 12 feet. We wanted them shooting from 10 or 12 feet. We didn't want them shooting threes. We did a great job of that until the last two or three minutes. Um, tomorrow night, we can't let that the big dude get in there and catch the ball at 10 or 12 feet. Otherwise, I might have three guys with broken bodies before the you know the game's over. 
Um, so the game plan is going to be completely different. And the great thing about our zone is there's only so much you can do against the zone. You know, it's like if you're going to play Oakland, we've got 77 set plays. You know, how many of those are you going to prepare for in one day? Against when you play zone, they can only do a few things, and we've seen it all. So we, we, we think we know what they're going to do. It's more of a personnel scout. All right, what does this guy do? We can't give him this. This guy only goes left. If he goes right, he's pulling up. If he goes left, he's going all the way. You know, all those things. My staff watched all their games. I only cared about the zone. They're putting that together, you know, the personnel. And I got an unbelievable staff that does a great job. I think we're very well prepared, and I think we'll be able to guard them. Uh, it's going to come down to what team makes shots and, and you know, who makes the plays that, when it counts. Front left. Yesterday you talked a lot, of, or before yesterday, you talked a lot about slowing the game down against Kentucky. Um, there were points in the game where it looked like you wanted to run on the court and grab your players to slow them down yourself. Um, does that change tomorrow? You, you expect a more fast-paced game? You expect to let them go? It's going to be a complete opposite game plan, and the reason is um, they're playing their seventh game in 11 days. Who does that? I mean, the pros don't even do that, right? But because they're in a league with 400 teams, they had to win five games to, uh, to win their league championship. So they'd play five games in five days and turn around three days later and play and then, you know, two days after that, play again. So what do we got to do? If we're smart, we're going to play fast, right? We want to we wanna make them run. That big dude's big, right? And they got a lot of big dudes. We want to make them run. And uh, at some point, they're human, aren't they? I mean, at some point, it's got to kick in seven games in 11 days. So, you know, if we can keep the pressure up and we get them to the point that their legs are tired – you know, it's hard to make jump shots when your legs are tired. So, and, and to beat a zone, you got to make jump shots. Before I got time for one more question, questions for Coach, right here. Last question, left middle. Uh, Coach, uh, would you be in favor of a video review component at the end of games in terms of fouls and stuff like that? Say that again. Would you be, you know, based on what happened at the end of the Kansas game last night, I don't know if you saw it, I know you were busy. Uh, would you be... There was a call at the rim that went against Sanford. Uh -huh. Would you be interested in some sort of NBA type model where you're able to challenge a call, or it's calls in certain situations are up for review? If I were them, I would say yes. Obviously, if it happened to me, I would say yes. But you know, man, we got way too many reviews as it is. You know, I mean, it, it's. It's almost a coaching strategy to ask for things so that you can get rest or you, you don't waste the time out so you can get your guys together. And I'd hate to see the game even slow down more. I think one of the problems with our game is the last three minutes take so long. Um, as a coach, I want it to take that long, but as a fan, I don't think I would. So to answer your question, I would say no, I'd probably not be in favor of it, but I feel bad, f you know. I'm a Detroit Tiger fan, right? And Armando Garb, whatever his name was, lost his perfect game because Jim Joyce made a bad call at first that today it would have been a perfect game. So, you know, and Jim Joyce, the umpire, said it when he before he died, the worst thing that ever happened to him in his career. Well, that referee probably feels the same way last night, right? So, I mean, it's, it's the human side of our sport, and I don't want to see that changed. Coach, i gotta, I got to ask about your hat. Is there any significance with that? Is it your favorite hat? You wear it all year round? or It's a brand called Live Lucky. Okay. And God, I need to live lucky right now, right? So I wear these Live Lucky hats, hoping it rubs off. I, you know, your brain's right there, so maybe it sneaks in a little bit. Gotcha. It, no, that's not Notre Dame, if that's what you were thinking. I had somebody ask me that. Is that Notre Dame? And I said, who? 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 All right. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it. All right. It. Thanks, everyone.
going to be uh, three fifty five. Hopefully they didn't switch it up on me. Okay, we are here with NC State student athletes Michael O'Connell, Muhammad D. Ara, and Bent Middlebrooks. We have up to 20 minutes with the student athletes before head coach Kevin Keats. Please raise your hand to ask a question, and someone with the microphone will come over. Please state your name and media affiliation. If you are joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We will address questions in the room first and get to Zoom if time allows. Okay, questions for student athletes. Left middle. Guys, uh, Will Graves, Associated Press. I guess this question's probably for Ben and maybe Mo. What is it like to have to guard DJ in practice? Ben, you want to start? Uh, I mean, I can definitely say it's, it's, uh, it comes with some challenges for sure. Uh, but I mean, I think at the end of the day, it definitely makes us better. I mean, I don't think there's another, another post presence uh, I mean, in the ACC, really in the country, that says as, as much of a force as him. So I think it really, honestly, has made us uh, part of the players that we are today, having to go against that every day. Mo, you want to add to that? It's easy. <laughs> no, I'm playing. No, I'm playing. Uh, yeah, we, we compete against each other every day, and DJ is a tough guy, and like we make for him complicated to get his spot. That's why he gets so well right now in, on a on a block. I mean, I wouldn't say all that. I mean, uh, but I mean, it, de yeah, it definitely, you definitely know if, if, if you're, if you're, if we're going at each other in practice, you're going to have a little soreness in your chest after having to take all them, them <laughs> post dribbles. But, but I, I don't know if I ever feel like I'm in trouble when I'm in there necessarily. Oh, same for me. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. All right, questions for our student athletes. Right aisle. Wonder, I'm Rob McGlam with Inside Pack Sports. Just wondering if you guys, what in your study session so far, what have you seen from their zone defense, and what have you seen from them offensively? Mike, you want to start? Work your way down. Yeah, I think uh, from offensively, obviously, you've seen how they played against Kentucky. They're a very talented team. They can score from each level of the court. Obviously, they can shoot really well from three. They have a few guys that can really get it going, and they also have very good post presence. So. Uh, just kind of today, and still watching film, game plan, and seeing how we're going to approach it and attack. Uh, for, from a defensive standpoint, it's going to be huge because if we let them get going, um, it, it's going to be tough to get the win. Mo? Uh, yeah, uh, we're going to play against some zone, like maybe 80, 98 time on this time, I bet. And uh, yeah, we're going to be prepared for this game, and we're going to be stay locked in and did what you do. Ben? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, mean, I definitely got to agree with, with what they said. Uh, I mean, they're, they're a, a very solid team. I and mean, obviously, they just had a, a great game the other night. Uh, I mean, they do, they do run that zone, uh, which we, we're going to have to be ready for. Uh, but I mean, I feel like if we do what we do and we keep on playing like we've been playing, we'll, 
will look good out there. Left middle. Brooke Pryor, ESPN. Michael, when you look at having to potentially guard a guy like Jack Golke, who just went off the other night, what are the challenges that come with guarding and preparing for a guy that gets on a hot streak? And what's it like to watch that film and kind of see the, all the attention that he's gotten nationally? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely impressive. He's obviously a very good player. It's not like he hasn't been doing this or making these shots all year. He's, he's just very talented. So uh, going into the game, I mean, we just got to – same game plan is what the coaches think we got to do to take away obviously his looks and not let him get a clean looks if anything because he's going to get shots off like we said he's a great player and this is what he does um so trying to limit his touches limit his looks and that you know that area of the game will be huge for us and you know just try to force him to take tough ones and then finish possessions with rebounds left aisle thank you um jerry DePaulo, pittsburgh trib uh you guys uh maybe all three of you can answer this question this will be your seventh game in 12 days tomorrow night. How are you able to do it? Aren't you exhausted? And you've been, you haven't been home for too much to, to settle down, have you? Ben, you want to start working way down? Uh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we definitely. I mean, I don't know about fatigue. <laughs> we've, we've been hearing about fatigue for for a long time now. We've had. He said we have played a lot of games. I mean, I don't, I don't. I don't see any of my guys getting tired. I don't feel like we've we've missed lost a step at all. I mean, as far as I mean, I definitely. I definitely do miss home a little bit, miss my dog a little bit, but uh, but uh, I mean, I'm I'm still trying to win some more games. Mo, oh uh, yeah, we tired, but we gotta compete. Like we gotta stay on top of what we gotta do, cause we here for that, and we got we can't complain about like we tired. Oh, we gotta play like seven games in twelve days. I don't know, but yeah, we gonna stay on top and. Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. At the end of the day, too. Obviously, we have a common goal in mind to keep playing, keep playing the game, so then the season to finish the season with a win. So at this point, you know, even if your body's hurt or you're tired, you're not really focusing on it too much because you want to do everything you can to win that next game. Right middle. Nathan, USA Today, Michael. You guys have quite a few graduate players like yourself. Quite a few guys coming in from different schools to make up this team. How much of this run is kind of the benefactor of? so many different experiences coming together to know how to handle yourself in different situations. Yeah, I think I think it's been huge that we have a, a team full of mature guys, guys that have been here, whether played in March before or they just, just had experience playing through a lot of games where, you know, they're coming to the end where it's a one shot, one possession game and things like that. So I think just experience is always going to help you out down the stretch, especially when things aren't going your way. You can have guys that are able to rely on what they've been doing or what they've experienced in the past with either the other teams or this team they've been with for, with for a while. Um, just definitely helps keep everyone together and keep everyone on the same common goal. Questions for student athletes. Right aisle. For everyone, obviously this has generated a lot of enthusiasm back home in Raleigh. Um, now it's starting to become national. I mean, your take on that, how surreal is it to see NC State, they're calling you guys America's team and things like that, and the love that you're receiving, both from Wolfpack Nation and now from the nation itself. Ben, you want to start? Uh, I mean, I would say, especially, I mean, back home at Raleigh, I mean, that fan, the fans' appreciation back there definitely, I mean, means the world to us. I mean, we definitely feel that. I mean, when the crowd gets loud and starts cheering for us and we're away from home, I mean, there's not a better feeling than that. I mean, I know DJ Burns when he gets the ball and the crowd just turns up for him, and there's nothing more fun than that, just seeing it. I mean, I know it's fun when it's on the court. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, hopefully, I mean, as far as America's team, I mean, I guess we'll try and keep that going. Mo? Yeah, we would really appreciate that because we need that. We need that. Like, we talk about we tower, but when we got to the chair, like, scream for everybody, for, for us, for DJ Burns, like, we need they give us energy and we really appreciate it. Yeah, building off of what they said, I, th I think it's huge. Just since we're not on our home court right now, we have a lot of fans that are traveling, and then just other other fans that aren't NC State fans necessarily still cheering for us. So I think when you're at these neutral sites and you have fans, a fan base there for you, and getting excited, it helps. You know, when you go on a run, helps just helps you keep it going. And then things aren't going well, they help get you back in the game. Left middle. Oakland was pretty clear last night that they don't want to be considered a Cinderella team, that they believe that they can beat anybody. <laughs> Do you guys feel like you're a Cinderella team? And is tomorrow night's game almost a battle of would-be Cinderella teams that could make a run in this tournament? Mike, you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I mean, 
It's kind of like what people have been asking us too is how we feel about being the underdog or lower seed in all the games, but we don't really focus on that because at the end of the day, like, we, we, we just focus on what we can control. And whoever the opponent is, we're just going to, you know, scout for them. So I don't necessarily know if we, you know, want to just be labeled as a Cinderella team. I think we just want to be labeled as a great team that goes out there and competes every day and, you know, gives it their all. Because at the end of the day, everyone in this tournament's great. I mean, the seeds can go flip back and forth. So we don't really focus on the number of the seed or anything like that. We just focus on whoever we're playing and then just controlling what we can control. Back right. Luke Taylor, Full Court Press Podcast. What would you say the song that best describes DJ Burns is? Ben, you want to take that? Uh, <laughs> Y'all don't got nothing? No. This song I don't know. Hey, Mo, it's on you, man. You got this one, Mo. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I would say Baby Chong, King of the Galaxy, Ooh, I think. That's a good one. A good one. A good one. You, you love that song. I like it. <laughs> All right, any more questions? All right, back right. Uh, Gar uh, <coughs> excuse me, Gary Hahn with the Wolfpack Sports Network. Of all the challenges uh, that this team's faced in the last six games, what, what are you the most uh, proud of uh, as far as being able to, to overcome those challenges? Um, you got that. Yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing is just sticking together. Um, obviously, the season hasn't been perfect by any means. It's, you know, we haven't, we didn't win every game and, you know, blow out every team. It's like we've had some ups and downs. And I think at times we really could have easily just given in, kind of caved into just what was going wrong and just embraced that lifestyle. But I think it was huge for us that we all kind of just banded together. And no matter what we were going through, we always stuck together and had each other's backs. And I think it's, I think it's been showing on the court, at least, you know, through the AC tournament. Even when the odds were stacked against us, it didn't really matter. We didn't really care. We were going to go in and just, you know, fight with your brother. And that was kind of the biggest thing is you want to have their back and same way as you wanted them to have yours. So um, I think that's been huge for us going through that stretch and even coming into this now when you're playing new teams you never played before is just rely on what you guys have been doing all year and just making sure you have each other's backs out there. During the, uh, during the regular season, the pack had some ups and downs <coughs> offensively. But you take a look at the last six games, all of a sudden NC State is uh, averaging 81 points. So if each of you would just give your, uh, your take on, uh, on what's happened. Ben, you want to start? Uh, for sure. I mean, I, I would say, I mean, I mean, it absolutely did have a, a, a season full of ups and downs and full of a lot of adversity. And it feels like, I mean, throughout the season, I mean, again, I feel like it's something that a lot of people don't really take into consideration. But we were, I mean, when we started out this season, we had, I mean, half of our team, more than half of our team was new guys who'd never played with each other, never been on the court with each other before. And I mean, that, that takes a long time to figure out. I mean, obviously, we, we, we came out pretty hot, but I mean, we still had to kind of deal with those issues and things like that. And I feel like a, a big part of the ACC tournament was us kind of coming together, figuring those things out, kind of fixing mistakes and, and issues that, that we had had. Um, and really just kind of like, like Mike had said, come together. And I mean, I mean when, we, when we play like that and we're playing together and everything's clicking, I mean, we're a tough team to play with. You guys good? You want to add anything? You good? No. <laughs> I've got one more. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the the mental and physical toughness that you guys have uh, have displayed over the last six games has been, been pretty incredible. Uh, what's what's that? Uh, what's brought that sort of to a peak? Mike, Mike, gonna take that. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think just we know. You know, this is this is it. Really, at the end of the day, when you lose, you go home. So you're kind of just. At the end of the day, you're going to go out there and give it your all. And even if things are tough, you know, you're a little banged up or body's not feeling great or you missed the last shot or anything like that, you're not going to focus too much on it because if you get caught up with what's going wrong, next thing you know, it can all be over. So I think just trying to focus on, you know, what we do have at hand and what the opportunity we have that's in front of us is kind of something that helps you just look past everything that's going wrong or all the tough times. Right, Isle? Uh, all the guys that are playing are transfers. And do you think that this season, particularly the back end when you guys are starting to succeed, is sort of a testament to saying, okay, you need to be patient with this. Sometimes it's just not going to click in the beginning. you got a lot of new guys from different systems coming to a new place, and, and this thing needs time sometimes. Do you think this is a testament to that? You got it, Mo. Benny or Mo, you got it? Uh, yeah. Uh, 
like you say, we got a lot of transfer and everybody come from different school, but we build the chemistry all year, so yeah, it take a little bit of time, but that's why right now we play so good because we know each other and we got back of each other. Any more questions for student athletes? All right, thank you.
Yeah, you. Well, at this point, you're paid. You paid to be here. We'll get you nil for you. For one of your pockets. That's right. No, ain't no question. I'm glad to have him. I see the familiar faces, man. These, I see. I know who we got. ESPN in the house. <laughs> All right, once again, please raise your hand to ask a question. Someone with a microphone will come over. Please state your name and media affiliation. If you're joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We will address questions in the room first and get to Zoom if time allows. Questions for Coach Keats. Brooke? Brooke Pryor with ESPN. Coach no, no introduction needed, Brooke. <laughs> What's the challenge in playing a guy like Jack Golke? I mean, obviously, all of Oakland gets really hot, but Golke specifically, how do you scheme up defense after a performance like that? You know, I was, um, I was in the locker room, and I could hear the cheering. And I will say this, I was completely wrong because I know Kentucky travels very well. And so I, I thought Kentucky was winning the game by a large margin because I kept hearing the cheering, I thought it was Kentucky fans. And um, so I got, I grabbed my phone and started looking up the score and, and obviously Oakland was winning. So when I got back, you know, last night, 2, 2.30 in the morning, I popped the game on, started my, you know, scouting for, to prepare to get ready for Oakland. And man, I, I don't know that I've seen a shooting performance like that you know, if I have, it's been a long time. I mean, and, and, and people are going to say, man, goodness, Kentucky didn't do a good job. And they were there. I mean, he made shots after shots after shots. Um, I just, we, we got to do a better job. How? You know, I don't know how that is because he, he can make shots. But there's so much more um, than the shots he made. It's a really complete team. And, you know, they got great inside, outside presence, well coached, do a good job. And, and, you know, I've told our guys, man, this is going to be as tough a game as you're going to play because they, they got an inside-out presence. They can make shots. They can score around the basket. And they're unique on the defensive end. And so, you know, it's a big, it's a really big challenge. It's going to be a tough game. Left aisle. Jerry DePaula, Pittsburgh trip coach. Uh, you guys will play s uh, seven games in 12 days tomorrow night on venues that you're not used to playing on. What – is the secret to your team not getting exhausted? And how do you, how do you keep them engaged uh, for that long without falling over? You know, when you go to Chick-fil-A, they never tell you what's in those, um, those sandwiches. And it's really good. So I'm not going to give my secret away because, <laughs> no, we, our guys are, you know, it's, I'm amazed at them every game that we play. And all the credit goes to them. We, we spend a lot of time in the preseason and during the season working on our conditioning. As a matter of fact, we've also called ourselves one of the best conditioned teams in the country, if not the best. And it's really paid off for our guys mentally and physically. You know, the the um, the great thing about us is we've gotten stronger in every second half. And you know, I just think the the buy-in and the energy that we provide through our our program and our energy that we give on the you know, on the bench, I think it really helps our guys in understanding what the opportunity is. And there's really no secret sauce. I just think our guys are in good shape and, and mentally believe that they should be playing in the game. Front right. Michael Perchik, ABC 11 out of Raleigh. Coach, I don't know if you saw any of the videos circulating on social media of NC State students packing uh, the bell tower after last night's game. What does that type of image mean to you, understanding the rich history of this program? Well, it means a lot. I mean, I, I love our I love our students. I mean, the, our students are the best, and we have a unique thing here at NC State. When you win a huge game, you know, we like that bell tower, and everybody meets at that bell tower. It was funny. I saw one video, and it was like, "When is it? When's the light coming on? When is the light coming?" I thought it was great, and you know, when we win, you know, it's it's not just about our basketball team. It's about our school, and it's about our students. I mean, we. You know, we've got, we're the only team that has, you know, three power five teams in the same area within 25 minutes of each other. And it's a lot of bragging rights going around there. And, you know, we've had a, a long history of great basketball. And just to see us playing that well and, and obviously providing that spark for our, our entire school and our student body who has, you know, been with us at games and screaming and yelling at those games, it means a lot. Like, I don't... You know, we don't just win as a basketball program. We win as a university. 
Questions for Coach? Back to Brooke. Kevin, you talked a couple days ago about just the number of bids that the ACC got or lack thereof. What kind of message does it send to the committee, each win that you have and each win that, that other conference teams have in this tournament? You know, the unfortunate thing is it doesn't really send a message. I mean, I hate it because, you know, we look at the magical run that we had last year from our, some of our teams, and I think we try to, you know, tap down on that a little bit this year going into Selection Sunday and it didn't work. Uh, I think as a, as a conference, we got to figure it out. Um, what, what, what really bothers me a little bit is that we put so much emphasis on the non-conference. So I, let's, break our, let's break down most of our team's non-conference. Let's say you play seven power five, and then you play four mid-majors or bye games, or let's say you know, you go six and five, at power five versus, you know, um, mid-major teams, five games. So that's 11 games. You can't tell me that that's, you know, mean, should mean more than playing 20 power five games in your league. And you got to go to home venues and away. So I think somehow we got to get out of putting more emphasis on the non-conference, because it, to me it appears that you can lose a bid in what you do in a non-conference opposed to how you finish. So let's use us, for example. You know, our non-conference was, was okay. We didn't really have a, the, the, the major win. But look how we finished when we went to our tournament. We won five games in a row against five good teams five days in a row. Now, if we didn't put so much emphasis on it, we would have been in the tournament no matter what because the way we finished our regular season and we didn't have that opportunity. It's, you know, think about this now. You got 10 great uh, programs and great coaches that are sitting at home that didn't get a chance to go to the NCAA, and that's just not really fair. Like the ACC is, um, you know, in my opinion, I'm very biased, is the number one conference in basketball, um, and we deserve more. now. We have to do our part. If, it, if the non-conference is what it's about, then uh, as coaches, we got to win more games, or we all have to figure out the net. And you know, some people figured out the net, and we haven't. But I guess winning will solve a lot of problems. But I just think it's disappointing, because I would love to see more kids get an opportunity. You asked me a great question yesterday. I still, the other day, I still think that um, we should expand the tournament because it gives more kids opportunities. Like where everything's about our student athletes, if that is true, then I know people say, well, we're ruining the tournament. There's still gonna be upsets, you know, whether you expand it or not, but it's, just, it's been the same amount since it went from 64 to 68. When it went to 68, nothing happened. It's still a great event. So why can't we add some more to it? And I think that will really help because I always say this, uh, anytime you can help the student athletes get a chance to experience something that's always better for our sport. Back right. Uh, Gary Hahn with the Wolfpack Sports Network. Kevin, of all the uh, challenges that the Wolfpack teams had to uh, face the last uh, six games, what, what are you the proudest of in terms of being able to overcome those challenges? Well, I think the biggest thing I'm proud of is our guys was, were, was able to block out any distractions. You know, we, the way we finished our season, and it was really tough, we, we lost four games in a row. And it would have been easy for those guys to say, man, it's just not our, our season and pack it in. And, you know, uh, when we were winning those games at the ACC, we were also on spring break. And it was warm in D.C. And so our guys could have said, man, we lose. We can go home. We can go on spring break. I think, I think the mere fact that we were able to lock in, focus, uh, not worry about all the distractions and, and win those five games and then go into the NCAA with a lot of m momentum and, and obviously pull off this, it says a lot about the character of the guys that's in that locker room. Front right. Coach, it looks like you were playing through the bigs last night. Obviously, big games from Burns and Middlebrooks. Different team in Oakland. Have you had an opportunity to take a look and see what scheme uh, is going to probably be best to attack the uh, Golden Grizzlies? You know, Oakland's unique, and I think that's what makes them special. Um, you know, they've got shooters. They've got inside presence. You know, they've got post guys. They've got wings that can play. And so when you get a team like that, 
you got to do a good job of defending them. So we, I think we have to defend them at all five positions. They don't have a weakness in their positions. But also what makes them different is, you know, they play a matchup zone, and you're not, you're not used to seeing that all the time. And with one or two days of prep, it's always tough to have that. And so I, I think, you know, our, our preparation is sometimes you can go into a, a game and just prepare for one side, you know, offensively or, or, or on the other side of a defensively. Uh, what makes them tough is that, unfortunately, nobody played us a matchup zone the entire year. And so we have, you know, a day and a half, not even that, because you can't even really take the court like that to try to figure out how to be able to score the basketball. So, you know, offensively, we got to have a game plan, but we also got to have one defensively also. Right aisle. Yeah, Rob McGlam with Inside Pack Sports. Kevin, you have a, basically everybody that plays other than Breon is a transfer. And so that's going to – sometimes it's going to take time. If you look – I don't want to imply there will be more five games and five-day winners as time goes by. But do you think there will be more teams in the coming years with the portal where in late February, early March, they start to find it and then go on a run as you guys have? Well, I do think – I think it's going to take a little longer than people think. I want you to think about – and I always concentrate on our league. Our league is so good that we lose a bulk of our, our players to the NBA. The guys who don't play end up transferring. And so most of our teams at the beginning of the year look different. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, sometimes our non-conference is not the best because we got so many new people. Uh, but to get back to your question, I do think that it takes a lot longer than people expect for transfers to come together. And you could see, you know, late January, February pushes where guys are good. Uh, my team last year, we were a little bit uh, advanced because we had a chance to take a foreign trip. We went to Bahamas and we got those 10 days of extra practices and we were able to play two games. And so that helped this group. We didn't have that, that, that group. We didn't have that with this group. And so a lot of times uh, it's going to take some time and it just depends on how many veterans you got back and what their role was when they were on that team previously. Right middle. You say today, obviously you guys are still in this, so it's a kind of a different situation for you, but there's been a lot of chatter about the transfer portal being open right after Selection Sunday, uh, and you guys are going to have to replace some of these guys that are helping you do this right now. How do you kind of balance uh, looking at who's there, how many guys do you kind of dedicate to that, and what are your just thoughts on when this is open? Yeah, I, man, that's a, that's a great question. Um, thank you for that because – I, it, it's been a, as a guy who loves to recruit, it has been a major challenge to balance getting ready for a great Oakland team and then obviously trying to figure out, you know, who can we go after in the transfer portal. And I wish um, someone is listening that, you know, we would push those dates back or change the dates or stuff like that because it's not really, in my opinion, it's not fair to the teams who have earned the right to play in the NCAA or the NIT. And then, you know, some teams that are not playing, they have the complete advantage to be able to recruit and you don't. And so I wish they would, you know, completely look at that. And uh, if there was a way that they could, you know, tinker with that and change it a little bit, because, you know, one of the things I sent to my staff today, I'm so used to playing the next day. I forgot after we won the game last night, I thought we played today. I was like, we played five straight days. so. I consider this a day off, even though it's not a day off. And I sent my te my staff a text and said, hey, hey, if you guys need, let's get on the phone with some guys who are in the transfer portal so we can try to, you know, get ahead of some of these things. But it's a complete disadvantage that we're in. Right, Isle. Yeah, you, and, uh, just a moment ago, you mentioned last year's team. I'm glad you did that because they're the ones that kind of lifted you up from where it was the year before. In do you feel like a sense of gratitude to like Terquavion, for example? He stuck it out, chose not to leave it in its worst place, and now you have this. Is this season sort of an extension of that decision and those guys of what they did last year? Well, absolutely. Um, momentum. You know, guys like Terquavion Smith, who, who I love, who, you know, committed to me when he was 15 years old and stuck around the program after we didn't have that great year. And, you know, to get a guy like Jock, uh, Jockel Joyner to come into the program and, 
you know, people forget how good those two guys were. We lost 34 points from those guys and a lot of leadership and everything else. But, you know, when we win a championship like we did this year, those guys were so important to us winning because they gave us momentum. And, you know, the guy like DJ Burns comes in and has a, you know, comes back as another year and Casey Morsell, and we were able to add some to it. But the guys from the year before laid a great foundation to get us right back on track. Back right. Uh, Billy Witz with the New York Times. Uh, I have a couple of uh, kind of NIL uh, questions for you. Did, is there uh, with is there anything unique that uh, that um, your collective does? And I'm just wondering if you can ex you know that or, or or if it's just something uh, like where you're just copying best practices or uh, you know that's out there. And then also. How does it, how does it work between, say, the football program and your program of figuring out kind of like, you know, there's only a fixed amount of money, of like where it goes, and some schools I know like Arizona where they're just separated, but, um, yeah, can you, I guess, elaborate on those yeah, things? Yeah, I, I, our collective one pack, uh, does a tremendous job, and here's why I say that, um, we're not. I don't have a lot of contact with them like that. It's completely kind of separate of us, um, you know, probably because of NC State, probably because of the state of North Carolina. So I think every state has something different uh, in our situation. We don't have a lot of contact with them. But what I do love about them is our guys during the times when they're not, you know, in class or basketball-wise, they have those guys out in the community, the Boys and Girls Club. They have them at Children's Hospital. They have them doing a lot of great things. I think that kind of separates us from a lot of people. Now, not saying that other people don't do that, um, but they're very involved. As as far as the um, you know dividing the money, I don't really know how they work. Um, I just know at NC State um, we need – you know, our, our folks who are, you know, a, a mass collection of people to be able to provide money um, to help with our student athletes. And I'm a fan of NIL because, um, you know, I, I remember back in the day when, when, you know, kids were going to bed hungry, didn't have any money, and, and they were selling their jerseys at the bookstore and they never capitalized on anything else. And so I am a fan of that. But, but I think our, 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 collect, our collective does a really good job of that part of it. I don't know how it's broke down. I wish I did. Uh, if I did, I would request. I, I like, I'd like to get $7 million if I could. It's a joke. Don't print that. I just want everybody to know that. But. Probably got time for a couple more front right. Uh, Coach, you said previously one of the differences between this year's team and last year's team is the depth. More guys you can count on to score and contribute. Last night, a good example with Ben Middlebrooks chipping in 21. Um, in a tournament like this in particular, where it's natural for these student athletes to have some nerves, to maybe have an off night, how vital is that depth where it's not one guy having to carry the load game in, game out? Well, depth can be looked at it in a different way. Um, it's weird because uh, we built this team to have 10 guys that will be able to play, and now we're down to seven or eight that's really contributing. Last year, team had more numbers that played. But what's unique about this team is like last year, if Tequavion Smith or Jaquel Joyner didn't lead us, then it was going to be hard for us to win. You know, I think out of these, um, you know, six games that we played, you know, in the postseason, I think we at least five of them maybe, we've had a different lead score. And that, that's a good thing because it's hard to, you know, uh, focus in on one, one guy. You know, Ben was great. He did a tremendous job last night. And what was so special about last night was, you know, as Ben was scoring, DJ Burns was just the most excited guy for him. And I think that's what's made our team really special. They're really happy for the success of their teammates. Our last question right here. Yes, sir. Greg Campy, I uh, just want to know your impressions of him. He's been at the same place a long time. He's coached a long time. Yeah. Are those things that you would want in your life? Would you want to be somebody that coaches 40 years or spends an inordinate amount of time at the same place? I mean, just your impressions on him and how that – is that the life you would want? Well, first of all, let's just start with the obvious. He's a tremendous coach. I mean, you you do not get the opportunity to stay anywhere for 40 years unless you know what you're doing. Um, that's not happening in today's time. Nobody stays. Nobody's going to get that opportunity because uh, – but he has done such a great job and um, probably – 
you know, I'll say this, probably one of the most underrated coaches, you know, in the country with what he's done. And, you know, you've seen he's, you know, put that program on the map. And, you know, I just – every, you know, two or three years you hear about Oakland and upsetting people. And, you know, I, I heard about him earlier this year. I think it was – and quote me if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was the Xavier win, um, pretty doggone good. And, you know, he knows what he's doing. He's put together a collection of really good players. And – you could tell people, uh, his players enjoy playing for him. He runs a system that's really good, and, you know, they know what they're doing. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it. Thanks.